three months. <coughs> Recording in progress. All right, folks. Um, I'm going to go ahead and call us to order. This is a um, a special meeting and workshop. This is Thursday, February 23rd. Um, so I'm going to call us to order. Um, everyone's present. I believe uh, Councilperson Saliba should be joining us on the oh, line if he's not. Is that him? The 202 number? Okay. Yes, he said he was joining by phone. Okay, great. So we'll go. We'll go ahead and um, so. A dish, oh, just a Alex, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, Glenn's not here yet, so do you, oh, yeah. do you mind sitting Come up here? Up. He, Glenn was just running a little bit late. He was coming from out of state, so. Okay. In terms of uh, additions and deletions to the agenda, I think the only thing that we're removing is E7. Is that right, Tim? That's correct. Uh, you want to, and he'll, will he be able to One, join the next? He's not here to present. Sponsor of this uh, proposal. Is not able to attend this meeting today. Okay. Is it so we'll defer that. Today? Yes. Yeah. He's making a. This is a renaming of a tributary in um, Great Marsh Park. So, so is he making a presentation? Yes. Not today, today though. Yeah. No, but that's the purpose we're taking it off. That's yeah. correct. Right. He's not here to do it. Mm -hmm. So that'd be the only thing we'll take off. Um, the other thing I would like to make as an announcement uh, to the good citizens of Lewis is that the. The cannonball has been found. Oh, so, really? You know, you can mystery solved. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you can stop worrying. Uh, it's Did been, they just leave it, it there? So or? apparently, um, more details to come. But according to the chief, it was left at Zwanendale and then turned into the LHS by uh, an employee of the Zwanendale this morning. So, oh, wow. you know, we, we have our, our have our armaments back, so we're we just you know, we're safe. So, so I guess it turns out that when the police put something on their Facebook page, yeah. it, it guilts so the thief exactly. into returning it's it a, because that's what effective, happened before. <laughs> it's an effective form um, it's uh, called neighborhood of police. control. So with that, I don't believe there are any other presentations, announcements. So we'll, we can get into it. Um, the first thing uh, is oh. unfinished business. Who cares? So this is discussion and possible action on a draft request proposal for concession services at uh, Roosevelt Inlet. Um, Anne Marie, do you want to take us through this? this uh, sure. Yes, he um, and, and Janet's here as well and, and can answer questions. Um, so what we did is we took what the the concession agreement was that that was initiated in 2020 and expired in 2022 and we took the scope of that and um, put it into an RFP um, that we would send to newspapers or well the Cape Gazette and post online um, and the idea is that the the proposals would be due um, on March 22nd and that in order to make sure that this is awarded before April 1st we would have a special council meeting on March 29th to be able to um, review the proposals and award award the contract so if you go to page three the last section of the RFP shows this is not a cost based because um, we've set out specifically what the charge would be so the the concessionaire would pay the city twenty five hundred dollars a year or one percent of the revenues generated from the shack so um, it's not a cost based proposal so it'll be evaluated based on criteria and the eight criteria um, that will be the sub, you know, the subject of what it's evaluated on are um, in section D on page three, and that would be the provider's plan for providing services, including whether or not they would propose to install a beach shack, the number of staff to run the operations, the number of beach wheelchairs that would be available, beach chairs and umbrellas, and the total number of kayaks, paddle boards, and mats and um, whether they would be able to service other areas of Lewis Beach from this location. Um, additionally, what other equipment or services would they propose to provide? Um, and what experience have they had providing beach concessions previously, either in Lewis or at other public beaches in the area? Knowledge and understanding of Lewis Beach rules and regulations, um, ability to assist, with water-related emergencies and medical emergencies, 
and references, and then they would be required to have both a city business license in order to engage in the contract. They wouldn't have to have it with their proposal, but if they're successful, they would. And a Delaware business license to, to be able to submit. So, you know, by having a Delaware business license, we know that they have been doing work in, in Delaware, which, again, they would also state that in the other areas of the um, proposal. So the, we have um, suggested that a pre-submission meeting would be held on March 9th so that any, um, in, any interested vendors would be able to come and ask questions and um, questions there and, and post any updates um, following that meeting. So, I mean, that, that, that's what we have. Um, again, it, it's the same scope that has been in place for the last two years. We um, indicated, and again, this is consistent with previous, that there would not be any sale or distribution of food or beverages. If that, And I know that that is something that has been brought up. So if, if you want that not to be part, if you want them to be able to sell water, Gatorade, stuff like that, you would need to change it. Pardon me? The bonfire, does that have a role in here anyway? The bonfires, we took anything relating to bonfires out. Okay. Because the bonfires we see, and, and the bonfires were not part of the scope of right. that the 2020 contract. Okay. So um, we, we specifically took it out. Okay. okay. Um, I, I have a couple questions. Um, well, one is, you know, again, the, the whole that's need to do it, because you mentioned it's not a cost basis agreement, so I still question the need to do it. But that being said, um, on point five under concession, but even though we don't want food, it says they shall not provide sale, just their, their business, per, the provider's business operations shall not include sale distribution. So that, that eliminates someone who, if in the future, they go into some other business. No, it, this is at the location. So we should say so that. Specify at the location. We should say that. Okay. Um, the other is as it relates to this is a one year contract with the option for a one or two year extension. Yes. Yeah. In, in my mind, we should just say um, this has a renewable, th this contract is renewable. Okay. We, we don't need to say for how many, why, why be specific about the number okay. of years? Under C, uh, the numbering, there's nothing under two. So that's either a, something that we that are missing or just a, an editing thing that we need to uh, that was clean an up. Thing and number five, two, it is an incomplete. Yeah. So we, yeah, same for uh, five starts with a lowercase. So I'm not sure what that, um, whether there's again something missing or whether it's just again, uh, you know, punctuation. It's just that line because of the two. I, Oh, I, yeah. I, like provider shall, I don't know I, if it's... I think that this happened when there was the, there were some things done in track changes, so I think when... So the there's nothing in front of provider. Right, okay. I think it's when All things right. were, accept, when changes were accepted, it didn't... And the question I have is on number three, I'm going back up the concession fee, the, was this something that was a, an obligation prior, like, yes. you know, the, 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 so there's nothing new that... The, yeah, that that's respect. exactly what it was. Okay. And then the same for uh, number eight, the provider must supply their equipment and may not use their party supplier. That that was all, also a prior requirement, or yeah. do we know? Okay. Janet and Alex, do you do you recall, was that something that was added, or was that? Um, no, that was that was added. So right. that the, the, the awardee would have to have all yeah. of their own equipment okay. and not go through a third party. That was added. Okay. Um, the only question I have to that is, um, and Matt, since you're here, do you mind commenting on this? Is how do you get that shack off the beach at the end of the year? Do you do you are you able to do that on your own, or or do you hire a third party to come get it? So uh, coastal towing. All right. Okay. So basically, um, that so that that's one of the questions I had. Where on the dates that you had, mm -hmm. um, May first to September thirtieth, right? October fifteenth was or it? October. Oh. No okay. later than October 15th. That so it would need yes. to be so off. If you're allowed, well, that's up for negotiation, too. It's right. For A1 telling, um, they basically ask for, they, they need a little leeway. Sure. So mm -hmm. if, I'm, if, if a business is paying for that time frame to be there, can we allow a week ahead of 
time for setup and a week after to break down mm -hmm. because the towing company basically was saying, look, we can set this date, but if something comes up, you're, right. you're bummed, right? right. Okay? Um, and that's because- We just need some the, idea. I just wanna- yeah. And then, but do you get it over- call them up, they, they, we get scheduled. Um, they come in with a, um, uh, a forklift, yeah. basically. On to the beach. Because this is another question on whether we're getting into semant right on, you know, semantics or not, but it says you know, motorized vehicles. So even though it's not on a daily thing, he's not renting ATVs or anything, nonetheless, in order to get the equipment no, th off the so beach, it requires a motorized vehicle. So that's vehicle. specifically related to the setup. That, that's not what that's referencing. Um, but it does say, shall not use motorized vehicles on the beach to conduct business operations. To conduct business operations. There's a difference between setup um, what you can't do is take a vehicle onto the beach to bring things to the. Understood. Yeah. You know that everything needs to be carried on. Um, but this isn't going to prevent the vendor from the setup, getting the shack no, onto the beach. No, because that's a once a year thing, and, and that's okay. done and under a DENREC permit. Um, say there was a hurricane coming up, so we can call them up. Get it off. You know, you pull it off. In an emergency, he's like. 24 hours, I can come down and get that thing off. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> so, look, what we have to do is just plan it because we um, uh, hurricane proofed it by um, burying, we hook it to four chains and cement blocks three feet deep so nothing can blow it. So now it's even, it, it can withstand a hurricane. Understood. But, and um, to get it off, we go in, we dig it up, unhook the chains, and then they can come in, lift it up, they take it to the um, roll back, put it on. They bring it to my shack here at uh, okay. the Beacon Motel. We store it all. Store. Okay. okay, that's helpful. Thank uh, you, man. Yeah. 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 So, but that we, given just like that seven day, either pre and post setup right now, mm -hmm. especially if the contract's for a certain amount of time, we're trying to mm -hmm. make money during that time, not setting up and breaking down. Sure. Right. Okay. So, right. so for setup and breakdown, if we gave like a two week window on either side, would that? Yeah. And, I, and you could say, hey, don't conduct business because mm -hmm. I right. it up two weeks early. You know what I mean? Because that's just for set up. But just for that, to get it set up and broken down okay. would be helpful. Okay. So two weeks on each side? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Matt. Before you. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. If I, Matt, I come on back. <laughs> I have a question for you. Are you finished? I am. Okay. Yes. I have a, uh, number eight, there's a statement here that. The provider must supply their equipment and may not use a third party supplier. Um, is there ever an occasion where the demand is so great that you are having to uh, supplement your own inventory with inventory from a vendor, another I vendor? Have you never have done that, had that problem? No, but we have, um, I have more than enough inventory. We have eight locations. Okay, so you can move it around. That one. So we have. You know, right there, there's 200 kayaks and 100 stand up power boards and 40 mats in storage or at, you know, the Beacon Motel location, yep. uh, State Park, Milton, Laurel, um, Lazy Elf and Breakfast, or wherever we are. Okay. So, all right. We have, we have action. We don't run out. Right. You know, okay. um, you know if, if it was like a, usually it's like if I have a large group. It's going to be like at Cape Henlet State Park. It's 150 Girl Scouts for the day. So that's where we're bringing, we're pulling from other locations to put stuff there. But um, at Roosevelt, it's, we usually keep it um, five tables, five singles, five subs, um, eight floating mats, mm -hmm. um, 30 to 45, 50 chairs, and 30 to 45 um, umbrellas. Okay, and the uh, the <laughs> chairs that you use for the mobility uh, feature, you you move those around based upon the there's need. There's always one there. Okay. Um, there's one at um, the state park, and we keep about five at our Beacon location. But numerous times we've had two or three down there where we delivered for you know sure for the need for that day. Um, but there's always one there. All the time, but we, like I said, taking two, three down there. But uh, but the important thing is you're able to sustain that kind of support yourself. You're yeah. not having to go outside. And, now, yeah. Right. Thank you. So. Okay. 
Yeah. Any questions? No. Khalil, did, did you have any uh, questions or I don't know if there's a way. Can you hear us? He should be able to unmute. He, he did text me and okay. said he's on. So well, he's all right. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Matt. All right. So, um, so it's a discussion of possible action. Um, so with those, some of the comments that we've made there, some of the, the changes, are, are, is someone ready to uh, propose a, an action or a motion? Sure. Okay. I make a, mo a motion to uh, request a proposal for concessions at Roosevelt. Okay. Can, get a, can we get a second? A second. Um, I guess we call it to uh, just a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So we'll go under that schedule. Just, just so folks are aware, I think, um, Amber, you did have a timing on here, uh, right? Yeah. So you want to yeah. just walk us through what that would look like for those who are um, interested in? Yeah, so, so what we will do is um, following today's meeting, we'll make the changes, and, and then we will get it. We'll post it on our website this week. Um, and we will get it to the Cape Gazette to run next Friday. And then there will be a meeting um, for questions, answers, you know, general information for prospective vendors um, on March 9th at 11 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And um, proposals will be due on March 22nd. We will open them publicly in this room and then we will bring a recommendation to mayor and city council on the, the meeting, well, at a special, a special meeting, meeting on March 29th. 29th. Okay. Have you set up a time for the meeting on the 29th? We have not because okay. I think we wanted to make sure, um, okay. we were thinking that could be a daytime meeting, but we, we wanted to verify availability of council. all of you. Okay, thanks. Right. Um, okay. Right now it would just be that one item, right? Yes. Okay. <coughs> So we, I mean, if you want, we could do it in the morning. We could do it at nine o'clock, get it out of the way, and what, then what everybody day of the week has is that? I'm sorry. That's a Wednesday. Uh, Khalil, any comments? Can you hear us about your availability? Mm -hmm. I might. No, I will be. But I think um, I will be. You know, most there. are fairly flexible. Oh. I'm, I, I, you know, I can make flex. I can be flexible. At, Although at if it's nine, I can do nine. Right. If it's nine. Yeah. Then I'll okay. have time to go. So we could. Okay. I mean, I don't expect it to be long. Yeah. We would okay. kind of give you the summary and summary then, of the right. proposals. And so tentatively, we're going to say nine o'clock on the 29th. Is that correct? That is that good? Does that that's work good. for all of yeah. you? Yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. that's, we're good. Yeah, yep. good. Okay, let's do that then. Uh, mm -hmm. March 29th, 9 a.m. Okay. Okay. Um, so on to new business. This is a recommendation approval of lawn and landscape maintenance contracts for. Um, Fully 2024 through FY 2026, which uh, that makes it a three-year extension. Okay, um, so, and I think from my reading of it, we're it's suggested that we maintain the incumbent, yes. Patrick. Okay, Do Thomas you, Janet. Just so everybody can hear the same thing, Janet can summarize summarize what we got in terms of bids. Um. So the current contract, which was a three-year contract, and then we did a two-year extension, that's due to expire on March 31st of this year, which is why we went back out to bid. The invitation to bid went into the Cape Gazette and was posted on the uh, city website. We also mailed the individual um, invitation to bid to all of the landscape contractors that have a City of Lewis business license. Um, we. Um, held a pre-bid meeting on January 27th. We had nine landscape companies, uh, their representatives here, um, to uh, listen to the, the bid specifications and um, ask questions. Um, we had bids were accepted through February 14th at one, um, and then we held the bid opening. We had three um, bids, and um, you can see on the attachment, um, Distinctive Landscaping, who is our, our current contractor, um, met all of the requirements for for the bid submission. Um, we had in their three-year total base bid is uh, $3,999, no, 
$399,000. Sign that one. <laughs> borrowed right away in 20 cents. Yikes. Um, waterfront landscaping and irrigation submitted an appro uh, a proposal. They did not include acknowledgement of the addenda. Um, their bid bond uh, was supposed to be um, a percentage of the three-year base bid, and their bid bond was uh, based on one year. Um, so that disqualified them. You automatically disqualify someone if they don't, they leave out anything on the, you mm -hmm. do, okay. Mm -hmm. You call them and say, hey, this was missing, or this, no? It all has to be, it all has to be submitted as is at okay. the time uh, and date do. Right, right. Other if than we, because if, they open if it we, right in yeah. Right, right, and if we allow them time to cure it, right. then we could end up it, with a challenge. It opens sure. it up um, to, yeah. And so you have the idea is that you have to have a fully responsive bid package when you submit it. <laughs> okay. So the, the final um, proposal was from Spasado Landscape Company. Um, they were also disqualified. The only thing that they submitted was their bid form. Um, and the specifications included other documentation such as copies of licenses, certifications, um, they, as you can see from the chart, did not include acknowledgement of the addenda, and they did not include a bid bond at all. Um, so those, those were significant omissions um, from the specifications. Um, therefore, the recommendation is for distinctive landscaping okay. to be awarded. Okay. When, they t when they provide unit costs, are, we, are they beholden to that? or? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. So if stone goes up to sixty-eight dollars per cubic foot. We bought a future essentially of saying forty-eight. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's how it works. Because there there wasn't anything else okay. submitted to to account for that. All right. I have a question for you, Janet. Uh, uh, was there any consideration, or would it be possible to include? the a practice of when fertilizer is put down in a park that uh, signs be placed to advise people that fertilizer has been applied and they might choose not to walk on the grass or walk their pets we can certainly we can certainly work that out with the contractor um, I don't think that's an, a huge additional expense so what we found is that some um, some services aren't doing that anymore when we just as an example when we spray in um, Stango Park only for the summer concert series they do like three sprayings for mosquitoes and bugs we had to call them last year and see if they actually sprayed because they're not putting the signs up anymore and I'm not really sure mm -hmm. what the impetus for that is but um, we can make that arrangement with our contractor but that shouldn't be a huge lift I would appreciate that. And is the fertilizer part of fertilizing part of the contract? Is that sub, can they sub that out? No, I didn't think all, they could. No, it's all through the the sole source right, there's, provider. Right. That's yeah. what I thought. Yep. Right. Okay. So the communication chain is just between you and the contractor, and not a subcontractor. Correct. Good. That's and, easy to manage. And the contractor, uh, the the park commissioners are also able to communicate directly with the contractor. And they do that with, with frequency and keep me in the loop on any kind of special projects that they're asking mm -hmm. a contractor to do that are not in the scope of the, the RFP and the contract. And the, the, when that happens, that becomes a cost plus item then? Is that mm -hmm. correct? And it's generally already in the budget. It, it, it might be in it's the tree budget. It okay. might be something that a park commissioner saw um, as a need. I, a, an example would be, um, in Canal Front Park, the stone gravel around the gazebo right. is a different specification than all the other gravel in the park, mm -hmm. and it's more difficult to walk on. Yes, it is. So the park commissioner put in his individual budget under the Parks and Rec Commission to have that replaced with the proper size gravel. So that would be something that could be spec'd out to 
this contractor or a different contractor. Or it could be something that be done in-house as well. It, yes. Right? Yep. Okay. Different options. Yeah. Thank you, Janet. You're welcome. Any other? Hey, what's um, our current situation with re maintaining Great Marsh Park? So the uh, master plan, the conceptual master plan that mayor and council approved was sent over to um, DENREC hmm. and um, I think it went over mid-January. Um, so I'm waiting to hear back. I, I was just going to email them again and ask where we stand on it. Because is there potential that, that we're, they would get more... Um, Th there would be more to do over there once and would therefore the bid potentially need to change I mean because um, I think r well right now um, mm -hmm. the 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 contract specifications are just for mowing along park road on that mm -hmm. exterior boundary of the park okay so it doesn't um, include the trees because this is where I was getting at I, I, I got I'd heard some from, from some residents that the tr state went in and did some tree trimming there along the edge the edging of the woods and it was pretty it poorly was, done uh, to the point it looked like Edward Scissorhands went in there so yeah, it was a hack job and yeah. uh, they also left coke cans and d debris around apparently and so is that on us as a part because we're managing that park or how does I mean how is that relationship working is what I'm right. getting at so so once uh, once we have the approval from the state for the great marsh Mar master plan then we can start to implement some of those things and they would be in in the budget okay um, this this landscaping contract only addresses the area along Park Road to the be grass mowed and and the circle by the dog park okay. so when it says um, either side of road it just it, refers right. to the grassy area right just the grassy okay. area and once we get the approval on the master plan, then we would do some mm -hmm. other things that are proposed in there, such as um, you know the, the the meadow. That was one yeah. of the things that was proposed. Okay. Um, working on um, taking out invasive trees and replanting with native trees. We'd start to build that into budgets. Into a budget, forward. right? Right. Because really, what this exercise with. Uh, Pannonia up to this point in time is just to satisfy the requirement for the lease. Right. And we have done that, I think, with the documentation, the master plan that was Correct. created. Right. right. So the next step that we need to do, I guess, is to do enter into that lease renewal discussion, correct, with the state? Well, I think first what we have to do is find out if they're approving well, the Well, I understand. Once, that, once then, they've approved right. that. Yes, and I, then, um, I apologize. I, the 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 renewal is um, the lease ends in 2026. Right. So we would enter into a, a lease renewal with with the state, and then you know start to move Correct. forward. If if they give us the approval to move forward, then we can start start the That's work. We don't have to wait until yeah. 2026. Mm. But right. that will drive right. the, the the land lease renewal. Correct. Yeah. So I have a question about the tree trimming. So the state of Delaware actually did a hack job yeah, on trees? Yeah, explain this because I, that was I've had to a me. call too about this. Yeah, yeah. I, I believe it was the state. Who is this? Like what state agency? Marty, did you send me those pictures along Park Road? That'd be interesting to know. Yeah. yeah. Come on up, Marty. Come on up, Marty. Marty. <laughs> our, tree, <laughs> our trees <laughs> are. We Let's haven't yeah. figured out. Let's make really, who, who did that? It, it would was. surprise me that a state agency would hmm. do a hack job right. on the trees. Just Ooh, because they, do it. Have, they actually have arborists. Yeah, okay. Look to me like, um, are there power, there are power, there are power lines. tools you can get, you know, it's the, the, the candy mm. and the That's what they sound like. I've never the seen them do a hack job like that. Mm. When the, I've seen it done along New Road, but it doesn't make big splinters like that. And, so. and was this along power lines? No. No. So it wasn't. No, it wasn't everywhere. It was sort of between where the University of Delaware is and where, what's that road called? I saw that this morning. Harbor oh. Point. Oh, Harbor oh. Point. Oh. Harbor yeah. Point. So between those, so would that have would that have been on d UD no. property? Could the 
university have done it? it wasn't, I don't know. Just, so I, I guess I'm just Well, surprised. but when looking at it this morning, it looked as though a car had had an accident or something. Well, that's I, the other thing, but it would be, it's, it was several places, oh, it, so. It did. Really it looked, it really is bad. Where a car went in, so I, uh, I really don't know. Yeah, that. right, I, I was trying to see if there okay. was an entrance so when we drove by this morning. We don't really morning. know who, we don't know who, who did it. And I, because the litter also would surprise me that the state would litter. Yeah, a neighbor told me that, well, resident. She saw somebody do it? That they, I asked how long ago have you, and she said, she reckoned somewhere 10 and 12 days ago she noticed the, right. the work being done. Yeah. Huh. You know, the other observation I'll share for you along Park Road is that on the, on the windmill side of Park Road, there is a, the earth and embankment there seems to have grown significantly during the winter months, and I have no explanation for it. I've, I've tried to be care, you know, walk, or not walk, but drive through that area with greater frequency to see if I see, you know, a truck or some activity, and I can't, I haven't found any evidence. You mean but uh, that's what I'm, a that's what the I'm University asking. Of Delaware side or the Lewis no, the side other, the Marsh side, if you will. So as you're driving side. towards Pilot Town Road mm -hmm. with New Road yeah. behind you, it would be on the left hand side. By the wind turbine? Yeah, I don't remember seeing it. Yes, up that's a spoil site. Yeah, it is a spoil site, but, but it right looks like beyond it's there. fresh spoils. Right, so there, there's a dredging there project a out yeah. there now, So and, and that is. That I believe that's university property where the dredge spoil site is. It's on the side of, you know, it's they beyond are. the creek. That so, is increasing from So spoils. that they might yeah. have had to, mm -hmm. a lot of times what the core will require is that you build up the berm around the spoil site to be able to contain the, the right. uh, material. Uh, I would, as a matter, I would just make the point that it would be nice uh, if they would notify the city that in fact they are doing that. They might not be required to, but as a good neighbor, it would be nice for them to, uh, that we had that kind of dialogue with them to set that expectation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. <coughs> okay. Make a motion. Yeah, you want to make a motion? So sure. ba basically it's a uh, Hobson's choice here. Got, uh, <laughs> yeah, we need a minute. Yeah. Motion so to we approve need to the make, make a motion for it. <laughs> a motion to approve the lawn and landscape maintenance. Can I get a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so we have Patrick going on for us again next year until uh, 2026, right? Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Yeah, 2026. Um, now we are on E2, which is um, some discussion of proposed uh, charter changes. So um, for those in attendance, there is a summary um, in the attachment, a synopsis. And the one thing I was going to ask Anne Marie is, um, you know, one, where it's, um, if you could just talk through where some of these sort of originated from. Yep. And then two, um, uh, the synopsis, is there, is there also an accompanying one that says, this is what it is and this is why we're making that change? Um, that's not in the synopsis, um, but certainly, you know, a Alex and, and Glenn did the drafting, but, but it was based on a meeting um, with staff. We, we can certainly explain to you why certain um, amendments have been proposed. A and we can, put, we can put something out in writing that explains it as well. Okay, right. and how do we as a council want to tackle this? You want to take these w one by one, just go down the, wh where they're about? There's about eight five changes. Of them. It would be here till midnight. Yeah, I mean, we, we can go through. Yeah. I think so we can go through pretty quickly, starting yeah. with section one. Okay. If you if you want to go to the first page of the the draft bill, and we can, I mean, some of them are pretty simple, and some of them are a little less simple. Okay. Um, in some cases, we may need to request that that Alex and Glenn explain because again, we we talked about the what we're trying to achieve, but the drafting is how you achieve it, so. And it makes, excuse me for interrupting you, Marie, uh, so that anyone who's reading along, uh, the changes are either, are all underscored, correct? The changes are either strike through oh. or underscore. Correct. Okay. So it's and so there's new, there's new language in there, here there too, that's all underscored, there, yes. correct? Yes. Good. So, and, and everything, you know, we, the, the whole bill is line numbered. Um, so I guess high level, there were a few things that we were looking to address. Um, one was the, the contracting thresholds, the um, 
the giving the city the ability to use the the county assessment once it is done because I think we all know that the county is doing their reassessment and according to the consent decree they will have to do an updated assessment every five years so they will always have a more current assessment um, there is the uh, how we deal with borrowing and um, and I think again, when we get to those sections, we can explain why why we've looked at certain things, um, and then um, the the maximum amount of property tax we can collect, and then we ask them to make some changes to the um, section of code that deals with sidewalk replacement because we determined that. The process as it stands in the charter right now is a very complex and um, inefficient process, but as inefficient as it is, it doesn't require any direct notification to the property owners who you would be billing. So what we tried to do was make the process more efficient, but then also add a direct notification to the property owners if in fact the city wishes to, to bill back. So. So that's kind of on the broad scale, but if we start on page one, line seven, right now the, we have to um, do competitive bids for anything that is over $25,000. Um, one that is a, a pretty low threshold, the ability to get bids because there's so much required when you're requesting bids. The ability to get bids for things under that is is not not very good. I think we what we did is we looked to use the state. The state has a threshold of fifty thousand dollars for materials and a hundred thousand for construction projects, but we just went ahead with the fifty thousand. Um, so that that's that's the the change we were looking for there. Can you give us an example of how this has encumbered you? Um, well, a, a, a recent example, you know, so we're looking at um, vehicles. So if, and, and we've been trying to get with state contract, but if we can't get something on state contract, technically we need to, Be able to go put together bid specs for vehicles. We also have a number of um, repairs. For instance, we've got, um, repairs that are needed for the pavilion on Blockhouse Pond Island that are going to be probably over 25 but under 50,000 and and again just get it, it it's hard enough to get contractors even if we just so solicit price quotes so then adding on top of that that they have to do all this paperwork associated with bidding and again when when you're bidding something you require a bid bond you, I mean there's a lot of administrative paperwork that typically contractors are going to find that it's just simply not cost effective so some of the smaller projects end up getting kind of pushed off because um, you know they're they're too too much to be able to do under twenty five thousand dollars but they're too large to do without bidding. And the state's presently 50,000. The the state is 54 materials and supplies and things and 100 for construction. So we're we're kind of looking to take the more conservative um, side of that. Okay. The one example you gave was were cars and this is aggregate amount. So what you're suggesting is one month we get one car $45,000. Next month get another car at $45,000. No, yeah. So, I mean, that's what this would allow. No, a aggregate, I mean, we, we would look at aggregate would be, um, you know, w what we've done is if it's in the course of a fiscal year, like when we've had things like that, haven't we? Like it, no. if, um, for instance, it most of what we're doing as it relates to this is working with contractors. So we, ha we need repairs on several buildings and parks. And if we, you know, get a quote and it's 30 here, or let's say it's 20 here and 15 there, we wouldn't award 
both of those because it's at the same time, it, it, right? So we we might break it up over fiscal years. How are we doing with the new vehicles for the uh, police department? Um, I mean, we have them. <laughs> okay, but did we do it in terms of? Yeah, we no, put out for bid, state bid. No, <laughs> with, with, no, no, with that, that one, we weren't able to get them on state contract, right. so we. And they actually got uh, the record. I right. remember this really well because this was a recent conversation when this when the police made their pitch for these cars. They actually were able to beat the price right. through from the state buying. Mm -hmm buying yes. power yeah, right. by going directly and dealing well, with the dealer, and car that, dealer. That, so that you know, also not, the idea of us being wedded to a state buying service does not necessarily no, assure but, us. And that's addressed in, in line oh, 23, but that, that is an area where we need to, I mean, what we're looking at for this is the ability to go up to $50,000 without doing a competitive bid. And, and it, again, we're still getting quotes when we're doing things. But we wouldn't. No, I understand that. We wouldn't have to do sealed bid, right. lowest responsible bidder. Can well, I, I don't. I, 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 can I address something else that's in this same section that's uh, you know that uh, is excluded anyway? The purchasing contract for uh, personal, personal professional services. Yeah. You know that would be one that in, if we're going to make charter changes uh, that we should, in my mind, should be addressing because this would allow you to use a consultant, uh, fifty or otherwise, with yes. without any. Right. without any bid requirements. Right. So me, that's and, not responsible and, either. Mm -mm. Right. Okay, so the issue with professional services I think is a little different and we could certainly look to um, change that. One, you don't need to change it in the charter. You can change it through ordinance or policy to make it more restrictive. Um, typically with professional services, you're, you're not selecting based on the lowest bid, you're selecting based on qualitative measures. So for instance, you want to hire an architect to do work on, you know, city hall or design something. You could do a request for proposals for architectural services and typically when you're looking at those types of services, you're not looking at the cost or the price tag, that may be one of the components, but you're also looking at the experience of their teams, the, the approach that they bring to the project and how they would do it, and, and you have different different areas where you would score it. That, if you, if you want to be more restrictive than the charter, you can, and you, you again can do that through ordinance. So you could adopt an ordinance that says if we're spending more than fifty thousand dollars on a professional service it needs to be done through an RFP process you, you can absolutely do that changing the charter to make it more, more restrictive kind of ties your hands a little bit mm -hmm. so you can make your ordinances more restrictive than the charter you can't make them less restrictive so we couldn't say because the charter sets it at twenty five thousand you couldn't pass an ordinance that says you can go up to, to 50,000. Right. So again, if the professional services, I would suggest that we do through an ordinance rather than through the charter because I think you can accomplish the same things without tying the hands of, of future counsel because again, the charter amendment is a legislative action. It requires two thirds vote of the General Assembly of each house of the General Assembly and a signature of the governor. So if you want to change it in the future, it, it's a higher bar. If you create an ordinance that sets the threshold that you want for professional services, you can do that without legislative council. action. You can do it by action of council. So, so I, I, think you're, I, I think you're right that we should have a very clear policy on that, but we could do that outside of a charter amendment. Okay. So the question here is, does council support the request to the legislature to change our bidding threshold from 25,000 to 50,000? Okay. I'm gonna to speak to that right now, if you don't mind. Uh, picking up on your distinction that you drew about professional services compared to services that might fall under line number seven. Uh, eight. Mm -hmm. 
the aggregate amount involved is not more than $50,000 as proposed. I think that's a uh, distinction between professional services of a consultant, for example, and someone who might be providing services such as uh, construction related. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a distinction that I, I do not, I cannot follow. I don't, I, I can't appreciate. I, I would fully expect that the vendor who is hired to provide those services of painting, constructing, you know, doing HVAC work and so forth, to be a professional in his field. Now, and, and, and credentialed possibly also. An HVAC contractor is credentialed. And they, you know, they're schooled, they're educated and so forth in that area. So I think that the idea that, that the distinction you're drawing I I don't support. Well, what I mean, this is the oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. So, what would you propose? I, what I'm suggesting is is that the uh, aggregate about I don't I don't see any need for us to change the uh, aggregate about amount more than 25k. I don't. But I, if she just and said for that either professional services or what you you well, seem right to be now there's yeah, nothing for RFP. So you for professional services right now it's not covered in the charter. I understand. So n regardless of how you want to deal with well, it, then. if you do want something that's a competitive process, you you would need to put an ordinance in because the charter doesn't cover yeah. that right now. That's my point. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Regardless of the amount. No, that's right. okay. That's okay. All right. Well, no, I mean, again, no, I think. Let's circle back because I think one thing I want to make everyone in the audience clear about today is the purpose of these workshops are for discussion, so none of the decisions right. are going to be made on this today. No, right. Right. So and I think what we'll probably see is some of these we'll, we'll bring we'll forward for we'll consideration in a regular over. meeting, yep. and then we'll. We, yep. uh, my intention would be to have a public hearing to right. uh, at some point in the right. in the process okay. because this is pretty weighty. Yep. So no, no decisions on this will be made today. No. <laughs> right. Yeah. So so I guess before we go further, let's talk about the process because right now the legislature is on the legislative break, which means right now the JFC is meeting, the bond bill committee is here meeting, but they're not running bills. Um, when they come back for, from the legislative break, which is in about three weeks, I think, does that sound right? That's when they'll start running bills. So we have a few options if, if we want to get charter changes done this legislative session. If w you all could act at, and the legislature wants to see an actual resolution, before they will make an introduction. So you all could do a resolution at, at the March meeting, March. or based on what you've said, Wait. what, what you, you could decide at your March meeting that you want to take public input and then at your April meeting pass a resolution. If, if we don't get something in by April, we will not have charter changes yeah, that's what I to run what this year because- um, Yes, I, I think if we get them in, beyond April, the likelihood of getting them through. So with that, as we go through, and, and again, you don't take action today, but at your March meeting, we can have this on there and you can take a vote on the various sections and decide if you want to move forward with even pursuing it or if you just want to take that section off the table for now and maybe say we'll, we'll look at it in more detail and have a, a path forward for next legislative year. Okay. The other thing is we are now in the first year of a General Assembly. The General Assemblies are two years. So if something gets introduced this year and doesn't get approved this year, it's still alive. The question is, what are the things that you all as a council want to have done before, you know, during this session? Because anything that's not done by June 30th, you have to assume won't be done until the next June 30th. So are there things that you want to make sure that you have in place before June 30th, 2024? All right, let's, let's move on to 10 then, so the vendor, the state piece, the, right. the con and, that's a chain and, next and year, there, line 23 for those who are following. Right, along. so there is actually, Ellen Lorraine and I reviewed this, and there is one change that, that we would want to insert is that it would also include any cooperative purchasing agreement to which the city becomes a member. 
We, we are a member of the source well contract, which is used by a lot of public agencies. And there are some things that might not be on state contract or where the source well contract price is better. Um, and in those cases, we'll use source well. An example of that is when we did the changeover of our parking meter system, we utilized the source well contract because the state does not have a contract with these different um, parking meter companies. So there are some things that, you know, because we're a relatively small state and the state doesn't have a need for, um, the source well contract has, has proven to be a, a better fit. In that case, the source well contract, again, is competitively bid. Um, and these vendors have gone through a competitive process. And that, with that, it allows us to um, look at each one and, and then you know, get their references, get their source well contracting prices, and then make a decision based on those factors. So the source well is a, a vendor, correct? Source no. well is not a vendor. No. Source well is, is a, a cooperative. cooperative purchasing agreement. Uh, okay, so it's a cooperative purchasing agreement. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And there are several of them. Source well is the one that, that we have used most um, and where we have, um, like, most of the municipalities that I talk to their managers are also looking at source well. So it just gives us options. We can look at the state contract, we can look at source well, we could look at what the county has. I don't think the county has contracts because they tend to use the state contract as well. So your idea, oh, sorry. Uh, you're ahead. suggesting that we actually insert in this paragraph, yes. we would identify source well as, or um, just a cooperative? Or we would say a cooperative, cooperative purchasing. purchasing. Right. Part of uh, part agreement. So you'd have generic language yes. for cooperative right. purchasing. Exactly. Right. Thank you. Yeah. And, and so a similar question I asked, and Tim brought this up, so has it, have we really been encumbered by this list? Because we've, we've certainly purchased things all, that aren't on a state or county list, so I guess in, for changing things, it is, have, um, have we, is this I, proven I, to be a... I, so there's a, a, a couple of things that I think this, this is very, um, it makes it clear that you don't have to do your own bid. So if there's ever any question, it makes it very clear. Okay. Um, Right. And then the minor one, if we go down um, to line 36. Oh, oh can I just add one more thing yeah. from this? This is also, and, and this addresses, Tim, your issue, where something might be cheaper from another vendor than we could get it on state contract. So it would allow us to work with that vendor sure. so that we wouldn't pay more than that. Okay. Because as it stands now, we don't have the ability to work with somebody who's going to give it cheaper than state contract oh, unless oh, we did our own bid. Okay. Right. Oh. So that, that's, that's a, a difference. That's right. a big, and, and that was something that NewArk had in their charter and we specifically asked um, Glenn and Alex to take a look at. Okay. So I know we've got a lot of lawyers in the, in the room today, but line 36, <laughs> um, if you could let us know, what's the import of removing the or there? Line 36, hold on, let me. Dis uh, sewage disposal equipment um, or to Well, it's or not, it's not about removing the or, it's about adding things that come in on line 38, 39, and 40. Yeah. And one of the things that we noticed in looking at this, and I think we've talked about this before, that right now it says you can borrow money for specific purposes. So it's the erection, extension, and enlargement, the purchase or repair of any plant machinery or appliances, you know, for electricity, gas, light, all those things furnishing of water to the public, construction or repair of highways and streets, and um, construction or repair of su sewer to defray the cost of the city, cost or share of the city cost of any permanent municipal improvements. It does not include things like um, vehicles. Right. So, you know, what, you know, the question comes when we do our um, mm -hmm. vehicle leases we want to make sure we're compliant there. Um, any other purchase or lease that we need to do for typical municipal things, it, again, and, and this would be like um, if we did a bulldozer on front end loader, I don't know, some type of maintenance equipment for the street department that 
that you could that would be proper for borrowing and probably most important the purchase of real estate mm -hmm. one of the things that in looking at our charter exactly. we noted is that the charter does not specify that you can purchase. borrow money for the purchase of real estate right. that's right and that so so it wasn't so much taking out the or it was Adding, adding those things. The other thing is there are two sections of the charter that deal with borrowing, and they're not in conflict, but there's a, a piece that, that deals with bonds, borrowing and bonds, and then borrowing for a smaller amount. What we thought was important to do was to have this larger section on borrowing include everything you can borrow for including so that there's no question and then it goes into the bonding which is where you get to on line 40 through 46 mm -hmm. and then it's further further in the thing that we'll get to where it says okay and then if you borrow a smaller amount of money you can do it without you know the referendum so it and which that that's what do you know what line that's on because because that's part of the thing is that there's the section there's um, section 20 of the charter but then there's another section um, section 32 of the charter also addresses borrowing and that's the smaller amounts of borrowing so we um, mm -hmm. wanted to make sure that it's clear that they both apply and that they're not we, we want to make sure that they don't get in, at some point become inconsistent with each other. Does that sound, is, mm. did I articulate that correctly? Okay. And what this, well, the, go, go ahead. Well, uh, well, on line 44, you seem to be, well, you've added the um, pledge shall not at any time exceed a sum equal to $75 million. Uh, what is that? Okay, so that's a whole different thing. So well, let's, but it's, can, can we go back? Um, yeah. So that we can get yeah, to it, I, with sure, get to it in order. Oh, that, sure. That's, but what that does is, right now, the charter allows you to borrow up to twenty-five percent of the total assessed value Correct. of the city, right. which that's a moving number, right? Do we Correct. even know what that is? At any given time, we can get it because we can get our full assessed value from the property cards. But again, as people build, the assessment changes, mm -hmm. so we do a quarterly. Right. updates to the assessment so what this does is it takes out that 25 percent of the assessment and it gives you a fixed number so that you're not continuing you're not having it. to right. it, it right. the, part that, the part that gives me heartburn though is the approved by the electors and you we're taking that out so we're saying so in the past to to borrow a large sum of money no, so, so let's um it what so what this says when you get to 45 is if it's in excess of five million dollars it need you need to have the referendum uh, i'll give you an example when we purchased along with the vpw in the county we purchased the the jones farm we had actually planned to because the interest rates were very favorable and our um investments were doing by, quite well we had planned to borrow through the state revolving fund um, our, a million and a half dollars to be able to you know, pay that back. And it was in going through that process that we discovered we can't borrow a million and a half dollars without going to referendum. So it, the concern is that on a smaller amount of money um, that that you not be held to the referendum, that the referendum is really for your large borrowing. Right, but we would have been prevented from b from borrowing money for the purchase of the Jones Farm, our, our percentage there, because we cannot uh, do this with uh, for land purchases yeah. presently. Uh, well, and that, well, but that the wasn't, you know, that wasn't as, that didn't jump out. And, well, and it's interesting yeah, because even Denrec didn't bring it up. Yeah, well, I, th I think that part of it is that in the BPW's charter, there's an anticipation that the city can at least purchase real estate because it discreetly says that we purchase real estate and we hold it jointly with them. So, but it doesn't speak directly to borrowing for the purchase of real estate. I think probably a, a comprehensive reading of the charter anticipates that we can borrow for real estate, but it doesn't say it explicitly. So I think, I think that's why we wanted to include it here. 
You know, the thing that, uh, the, one of the things that troubles me here is on line 38, it's suggesting that we would be uh, using this language to purchase or lease motor vehicles. And I think of motor vehicles with a uh, term life of probably no, not more than 10 years. They're quickly, we should be depreciating. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure we do, but we should be depreciating. And um, it seems curious to me that we would be building into this opportunity to go into debt, to create debt to uh, for the purpose of purchasing a vehicle which is going to be depreciated or enter into a lease. We're not really, you know, we're not building, uh, we're not we're not making improvements here. Right. We're just But these are things we're doing. These are we, we currently when we purchase a trash truck, we have been doing a seven year lease. So um, we we also do fleet leasing for um, our our regular fleet vehicles. So but what what we're trying to do here is is make the clarification to make sure that there's no question at at a later date if somebody looks at it that there's no question that this is allowed. And but we're not but we're not doing a bond to a, in fact right and make those purchases or lease those right. vehicles and that's where and that's where on line 42 it. The adds the language amount. that you know if if you're coming up to five million dollars five million dollars or more you have to do a bond so if we do a trash truck lease over seven years and we're doing you know and that allows us you know to to equalize the expense rather than have these big blips um, in our our numbers that you know we pay thirty five thousand a year over seven years, mm -hmm. 40,000 a year, whatever it, it is, um, this just makes it very clear that we're, that we're able to do that. It doesn't change something. It, it, some of these things, we just wanted to make sure that mm. there's no question. And doesn't have to be approved. What it, can, um, maybe Alex and uh, Glenn can describe, uh, define this for me. What is a discrete bonded indebtedness? It's line 45. So, I mean, this language is speaking to any anything that's bonded. Uh, I mean, anything that's more than $5 million needs to be approved um, by referendum. But a discrete bond indebtedness, I, th I think it means a discrete item. So this, this $5 million, if, if this item is under $5 million, it do, does not need to go to referendum. If that item is under $5 million, it doesn't need to go to referendum. If they're somehow linked together, then you have something in excess of $5 million. It certainly needs to go for a referendum. But I think that's the reason the word discrete is used. Do we, do we borrow that from anywhere? I don't think, think so. I use the term discrete as just a drafting attempt to say an individual bond. Um, and not collective. Not collectively. Yeah. One by issuance. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Thank you, Alex. And was there the, the seventy-five million? I mentioned you looked at a percentage of what our our holdings are, but it, was there a calculus that we used to come up with the seventy-five million? You did look at what it is now, right? Yeah, the seventy-five million. I don't. That, that was our number because that's what Rehoboth Beach is currently set at, and I figure that that's something that the legislators legislatures are comfortable with because they've done it previously for another municipality. So, I mean, we could what certainly look at that number. Um, we. What's the number now? Well, when is we did 35? the when we did the bonds in t 2005, mm -hmm. it was 39 million. I thought it was 35. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, it, but it, again, that's you know almost 20 years ago, um, you know, we could see what 25% of our current valuation is and give you that so that you can choose a number that that you're comfortable with. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the I'm going to let the audience make comments, but I'd rather get through all of the changes and right. that way you can comment on all the right. various changes that you've got. So the, the um, you know, again, the, the purpose of looking at that is we, we know that we're likely to do a bond issue mm -hmm. and we want to make sure that it that whatever the, the number is is up to date. Okay. So um, it's sufficient and, enough to do and, what we want to do. And again by twenty five percent of the you know 
total assessment of the city, that it's a moving target. So the idea is to have a very you know, definitive number so we know what that number is. Um, so that's where, if you look at line 49 through 51, you have strike through. Right. So that, that right, has, exactly. It takes right, that right, out right, and right, it right. replaces it with, right. the, with an actual number. Right. Whatever that number, you know, what, whatever number I think you all, and, and we can figure out exactly what 25% of today's assessed. assessed value is. So without getting ahead of ourselves, we could, in, in, in one case, accept some of this language as it relates to what you can use the bond for, but maintain if we want the language that talks about the percentages and all that. Well, yeah, the that's exact right. Exactly. Right. You, yes. Okay. You, and again, this was to, in some ways, to, to make it clearer. Okay. Then, rather than have to chase down several numbers to figure out what it is. Okay. okay. Well, like I said, I'll take public comments after we're, we're through. But anyone else from the table have comments on this section yeah. before we move on to? I, 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 I actually Khalil, go ahead. Uh, excuse me. Can you can you guys hear me? We, we yeah. can. Yeah. I just have a quick question. I'm trying, uh, on the twenty-five thousand um, dollar threshold for, for contracting that that's being proposed to be raised to fifty. When was that twenty-five thousand uh, dollar threshold established? What year? Um, so we we could look and see, but I know our last major charter change was two thousand nine, right? Mm -hmm. So it was at least two thousand nine. We, we can look and see what specifically the changes were in 2009 um, and, and you know, if, if it was already in place then. You know, so, so yeah, so right. we could look at what the, the value of that right. I mean, amount I mean, was in today's my dollars. My point is inflation. Right. Well, you know, I mean, I, I don't know why this is such a, is generating such a controversy. I mean, if, if it's not keeping with inflation, we need to, we need to keep, you know, you know, um, increasing it. But that's my, my, that's the only question I wanted to see, and I don't, I don't, just don't understand why there's so much angst over that. But anyhow, maybe, maybe it's not 50, maybe it's 40 based on inflation. But that, that was my key question. Thank you, appreciate it. So, All right. and we'll figure, we'll figure that out. Um, we'll, we'll <clears throat> research. Um, that that's easy enough to do. Okay. So um, the next section. The, the next section. Assessor has to do with the assessor. Yeah. Uh, so why don't, why don't you take us through the changes right, there? Before we go there, yeah, go I do have a question. I want to keep, stay on the page three. Uh, let's see, it's line 52. Um, my question is, uh, this ties, this language in here uh, is predicated on or suggests that, you know, land values are always, stay the same, right? And they might fluctuate a little bit, but um, when we are, Basing this bonded bond, the ability to float a bond, to uh, to the valuation of the land. Mm -hmm. My question is, what did what was our historical uh, experience? What ten years ago, whatever, when there was a when the real estate market bottomed, and you know the valuations. Well, it were, it only were, it only comes into to play when you revalue. So the assessed value we the last we assessed was 2000 right. right so regardless of regardless of what the market does we haven't changed that 2000 assessment so it's still based on that 2000 assessment um, but so this, this would this proposed language would strike the last assessment uh, right, right, but, but it so sets it, it just at be it sets it at twenty at seventy five thousand. Period, regardless of what the value of the land is, or land and improvements. Mm -hmm. With that suggestion, it, it would replace. I'm sorry, I'm i seventy five million. You mean? Yeah, yeah. did you I? Said yeah, 1, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, you were looking for yeah. seventy. I'm not. I'm not used to those big numbers. Like Cleo said, we're in inflation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> seventy five okay. million, right. not seventy five thousand. Yes. Right. All right. Okay. So, so I'll, I'll have to think about that some more. So okay. the um, section four, and I'm going to ask Glenn to kind of go through the specifics, but the idea here is twofold. One, by charter, we're required to, to have an assessor. Mm -hmm. um, and the assessor under the charter is supposed to be a Lewis resident. We have had a very difficult time finding an assessor to be appointed 
who meets the qualifications lives in town and is not Practice. active in the real estate market. Mm. So one, if if we have a um, if we have an assessor, it allows us to not not bind that person to, to being a Lewis um, freeholder or leaseholder and a bona fide re bona fide resident. So um, that that's one thing. This is just simply to re recognize it, the it, fact that we don't have any money. Right. right. Then the other piece of this, the larger section, and again, in terms of the specifics, I'm going to let Glenn and Alex take it, but is, again, knowing that the county is about to adopt a new assessment in the next couple of years, mm -hmm. this would give the city the ability to utilize the county's assessment, which will be more current and based on the consent decree, will remain current. So that means the city would not have to incur costs to do reassessment at any point in time, that we're using more current values, which is, has an equalizing effect to make sure that um, you know over, over the whole of the city, um, the, the values are more um, consist closer to to what the the market values are based on a 20 something year old assessment so this simply gives council the ability it doesn't force you to use the county assessment it gives you the ability much like the ordin or the the charter change the that we did a couple years ago where it didn't obligate us to use the state voter registration but allowed us to. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So you all would have to, if you want to use this the county assessment, you would have to adopt an ordinance to do that. And beyond that, I'm going to yield to the, the I experts. Think you, I think you explained it perfectly. Okay. And is, Glenn, is this um, function to what's being done in other municipalities or? You're the first one that would be would, would be adopting a charter amendment that is directly linked to the new Sussex County. It would, would allow you to directly link to the new Sussex County um, assessment only because nobody else has gotten up to speed with a charter amendment to, to do it. I wouldn't be surprised if others follow your lead on this, but there, there are there are some municipalities that use the county assessment already. Right, they use the assessment already, but but right. this anticipates the the new one. Um, right. And again, as Anne Marie said, I think this is just putting another sort of tool in your toolbox, and if you, if you, we can, want you can choose to, to do it or not. Right. 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 And, and how and would that work functionally, though? So, like in a future council, if this was adopted, they would just at their election, their annual election, decide that year we'd rather go with an assessor rather than this relying um, on the uh, Sussex uh, County. How, how would there would have to be an ordinance. So there's a. Uh, state code provision in title 22 that allows municipalities to adopt the county assessments and so if you look at line 67 of that language prior to february 1st that's a state code okay. state code requirement and then the state code also says that um once the, the municipality adopts the use of the county assessment it'll continue until revoked by ordinance Okay, so the only awkward thing for us is the February 1st date is doesn't necessarily align with our well, annual and, and it's but interesting because Ellen Lorraine, that was one of the questions that Ellen Lorraine and I had as we were going through, what's February 1st? So now, now you've answered the question we have, and that, so that's state law. Okay. Um, let me give Tim, Tim a second to get back to the table and question. Yeah. So are, does anyone from the table want to move on from the assessor conversation? Yeah, well, let's okay. Let's we'll, 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 we'll go to the we'll go to the audience after we're all the way through, so they can make comments. But we're we're good from the table on the explanation of the assessor. Okay. okay. So that leaves. That keeps, I th that there's quite a bit in here. That section section five is also about the assessment. Mm -hmm. Section mm -hmm. six is also about the assessment. So there's right. quite a bit. Right. Because that language goes on for exactly for, right. for a while. Right, right, so right, right, right. so then moving on. Beyond assessor, I'm still scrolling. Um, well, with the assessor, though, could you touch on what's the appellate process for the assessment of taxes in certain situations? The change there. So, if if I'm going to let Alex do it, because so, um, under the state code provision that allows uh, municipalities to use county assessments, um, it's not entirely clear that the appellate process would happen anywhere other than the state level. Okay. So, uh, with if the count if the municipality adopts the county assessment i just deleted um the appellate process for that they would mm. just go straight yeah. to the state 
Yeah, would you reference the line, please? Because I, uh, that you're. Yeah. I marked uh, line 192 as a qu something I wanted to ask questions about, but um, I'm not sure. What well, that, that's what it is. That no city level no assessment si appeals would take place, so your yes. appeal would be to the county. Yeah, that's what he just addressed. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, probably for us as a council a philosophical question, which is do we want to see that the uh, that to that's right, uh, right, you know. yeah. it that's is right. Um, I mean, it's the purpose of being a municipality is that you maintain yeah. some of your own control, right? Right, right. So Again, um, this gives you the ability to but adopt it, but to. it doesn't require that you right. adopt it. Right. It gives you more discretion rather than less. It's not restricted. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. So, and I think like even but when- Yeah, but if you don't adopt, so in this case, we haven't, we're, right now we're um, without an assessor, right? Mm -hmm. So in this case, if we didn't do it, we didn't accept, we don't have an assessor in place, you would default to the no. prescribed. Well, uh, well does it, it, does, it doesn't you default, you, you have to. Because you've elected you, not to have an assessor, so therefore you you default well, to this process. So, so two things, one, you have to pass an ordinance to, to move into the state or to the county assessment, so that you have to actually take action, there's no default. Okay. But the other thing is, it gives you more discretion in who you can choose as, a, as an assessor as the appointed assessor. It, gi it gives you more discretion because right now the person has to be a bona fide resident, mm -hmm. leaseholder, freeholder of the city of Lewis. So, so by doing like you, you and I had talked about right. somebody before and that person doesn't live in town. So we can't, you know, so, so the question is, um, it, if this is approved, if this charter change were to go into effect, and you still want to keep a local assessment, mm. you would then be able to, to choose somebody who does not live in town to be your assessor. But who's otherwise qualified to do the job. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. But uh, may yeah, I just, I'm going to ask Alex to repeat himself. Yeah. I, I, maybe I wasn't paying attention. Okay, I, I'm re I don't, I own it. I, <laughs> did, I, did I understand you just say that in the uh, uh, appeal process that there would be an appeal through the state? Is that what I heard you say? If the county assessments are used. If we've got okay. a so presently, so presently, so if there's an appeal, it stays at this level and you all hear the tax appeal, the, the appeal, um, any tax appeal comes, the assessment appeals come to you Correct. currently. Right. If you use Sussex County's assessments, then by state code, you, ha you cannot have a local appellate avenue. Right. It has to go through a state process, which means you. And the state process is located at the county level. Is that correct? It's not clear. So, so what's not clear about state law is whether the county's assessor would be willing to do assessment hearings at the county hearing, or whether that person has to actually file an action in state court to have their case heard. It's clear that they can go to state court. We don't know whether the county would handle. Um, any of those appellate levels. It's clear they can go to state court and it's clear that you cannot hear the, the appeals as a, as a city council if you use the, the Sussex County right. assessment. And of course, th I assume that there would be fees incurred by a someone who's appealing a, an assessment, yes. is that correct? Yes. We, we could I, find I, out what the county what the county does now if somebody right. wishes mm -hmm. to appeal an assessment. Yeah. Can you sure. check with Gina on that? Thank you for that. I appreciate you. All right, so there's two that. two more major sections, right? One is what, the increase well, there's of what, one property more tax and then the sidewalks. Right, so there's one more thing in this. All right. It takes the exact penalty for non-payment of taxes out, so it allows you the discretion yeah. to set what that penalty is. Right. Because right now the charter has it at 1%. Right. Mm -hmm. There are some places that do 1.5%. So this would allow you to set, our own. to set the penalty. Right. And that's so in the section tw 202 to 206? 203, and, 204. And okay. Right, and 190, paid, yes. Right. And, and 197, that, okay. yes. Okay. Yeah. So, and then, right, th so the next one is on line 213, 214, and this is, again, right now, um, the charter limits us to, um, three and a half million dollars in property taxes in a year. That, the, the amount that we collect each year is going up just by virtue of the, the property, well, by, 
you know, so we're not changing anybody's taxes right. unless they build. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're improving your house, so then your assessment goes up. So we're coming right up against this three and a half million um, just by mm -hmm. people improving their properties. We also know that we've got um, Lewis Waterfront Preserve that's going to be built out. Mm -hmm. We've got Old Town at White's Pond that'll be built out. Fisher's Cove. Um, Verdon. Verdon. Mm -hmm. We've got um, Henlope and Bluff that hasn't come in yet. So we've got a number of units that are going to be added. So the idea is that this allows you know, for what's been happening naturally. Is it required to have to any cap? I mean, why do, can you just say that you, you just put a period at the, um, where it says lands belong to the city, period? So um, you could certainly propose that. The question is, would you get the legislative oh. votes? So I, we have to put a number in. Um, does, de does the state of Delaware have a cap on what they can tax? Of course not. So but you know, this, <laughs> this paragraph, uh, <laughs> starting at line 208 to running through 214 it the way i read this this is a this language is applicable to lease lands not fee simple it, oh, it's it, it's interesting because Ellen Lorraine and I have discussed that and i think it could but for the the fact it, so i think that they're missing a comma cuz if you look at the first clause of it to levy and collect taxes for any and all municipal purposes upon all real estate and improvements located thereon. In my view, there should be then a comma. And to levy and collect taxes for any and all municipal purposes upon improvements having an assessed valuation of at least $1,000 located on land under a valid lease for a period of 10 years. Mm -hmm. So I think what that's saying is the, the first clause is for everything that's not leased land. I think there should be a comma there. And then it adds on. So, so I think what that's saying is if you have leased land that is on a long-term lease with the city and you have a shed on it and that shed is worth $500, that shed's not a taxable structure. And, and is that, is that how you read it? I, I, that's exactly how I read it, because I think there's another section of the charter that talks about lease lands and basically ties $1,000 in improvements to lease lands. It sort of sort of says the city should not be leasing lands unless somebody's willing to improve those lands with it for at least $1,000. I'll try to find that, but, but I think that's exactly the way that it's it's supposed to be read. Yeah, but, but we've had that discussion too, because I think um, it it's not the best drafted language. No, it's not. Be, yeah. Well, if this is if this is a draft that you're submitting, it would be submitted to the legislature, and you're making a suggestion of a comma, put the comma in, because right now Got that I, I and I, I don't I, even agree well, with this explanation. That's what we're doing right now, putting the comma in. Well, she it's just not but it's not no, marked. It's not there, I know, Carolyn. But we're going that's but my point. No, I understand your and, point. And again, we can talk to legislative attorneys about clarifying the language. You know, I, I think. I don't think it's when when the. I think the once you start taking out whole sections and rewriting them, it it might draw more confusion, and they might, you know, it, again, remembering that these need two thirds of the legislators mm -hmm. in each chamber to vote. Um, we just so, want so, so that thousand dollar number to tie to the definition of leaseholder. For the purpose of this chapter, a leaseholder shall be deemed to mean and include a person having land under a valid lease, either in his own name or, in, or as a co-personer or jointly with his or her spouse from either the state of Delaware or from the commission of Lewis, the city of Lewis, for a term of at least 10 years, whose lease is recorded in the office of the recorder of deeds in Forsyth County, and who is erected upon the leasehold and improvement having an assessed valuation of at least $1,000. So I think that's where that $1,000 leasehold connection comes in and then one last thing here I mean Khalil asked that you know when the last time the other threshold was raised can you could you also endeavor to find that out here is yeah if this if is original or whether this was raised one. off the top of your head when we, when we increased to three and a half million let me double check on it okay. but but I know we we talked about that recently so mm -hmm. so that that we've looked at okay um, <laughs> and then to finish off this this section 
219, you have a scratch through of 10% assessed valuation. Yeah, so so with, this is the short term borrowing. Oh. Um, so one question that, that I have for Glenn is um, on line 221, and Glenn and Alex, I guess, I'm sorry, um, is $1 million. And I guess should that should that be what happens if it's between one million and five million? I mean, I'm just wondering if if it should be you have this rule for if it's five million or more, and this other rule if it's up to five or under five million. It, it's just a question. I think that's probably right. We, I mean, we talked about a million dollars when we first got together right. on these, but but I think that's right. To there's there's a gap that's on the yeah. I. My goal is that whatever we come up with and whatever is approved is clear for people until they, for whatever reason, decide to amend the charter again. Not that they choose to amend the charter because we weren't clear. So you're suggesting one to five million? Is that what the well that uh, this would be? Um, that correct. That, that this would be instead of not exceeding one million, that we would say five. of less than five million dollars. And that way you have two paths for borrowing if it's under, under, mm -hmm. you know, and, and again, all of those are things that you, if you're not comfortable with that, just know that that would have kind of three different borrowing scenarios. Okay, so that would that be if, an alternate language, right? And right. this would be, five, uh, basically you're saying five million without referendum. Right, and but it already says that elsewhere. You all still have to approve it. I mean, we're not... It, you know, it's not, and, and again, just reinforcing that the charter is your framework. You can always adopt something by code that is more restrictive. If you want to develop an ordinance that sets certain parameters about how, you know, different things are done, that can, that can be done. Um, by by council, but you don't then have to go back to the legislature for permission. Okay. okay. Nothing nothing that changes here automatically gives. And Glenn, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Alex, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Nothing in here gives staff more authority to do things. It gives the council more authority to do things, and if. And you city the ability to do right. things, right? Writ large, yeah. Thanks. Okay, and then the last section is having to do with uh, sidewalks and yeah. the process for. So, uh, so this, so as we've, you know, uh, as you know, we are looking to have a more proactive sidewalk replacement program, and as part of that, you know, we've started looking at. Um, I, we met with Charlie yesterday. Apparently, the sidewalk stuff is going out to bid in March, and when we get the the bids back, that's when we're going to start the, this process because we feel like it's better to, um, if, if we're saying, you know, whatever property owner, there's a cost to do your sidewalk. We want to be able to say this is what it is based on bids, not based on a construction estimate. So. But as we were going through the process for being able to do sidewalk replacements, it requires a resolution that specifies the names and addresses of all of the properties adjacent to which the sidewalk's being replaced. You do this resolution and you advertise it in the paper and then you have a council meeting, then you hold a public hearing. Then you make, after the public hearing, you make a decision. Nowhere in there does it say that you actually notify the property owners. You just have to mm. do a resolution that might say we're replacing Glenn Mandalis' sidewalk and note his address. And, you know, we you only put the title of the resolution in the paper. So unless somebody goes, so there's no part of that that actually has us proactively um, notifying. Re notifying but it has us go through all this weird resolution public hearing stuff. So what we thought made more sense 
was that you kind of take out the things that just add time to the process and not value, which you'll see in a lot of the strike through, and you would still adopt an ordinance or resolution specifying where and when the work will be done, but it also says, if you go down to line 266 through 268, that at least two weeks before the exercise of power under this section in any particular interest, instance, sorry, the city manager shall provide notice to the owners of property in front of or adjacent to the location where it will be done. Right. So what we're saying is you don't, you still have a resolution, but you don't have this elongated process of resolution, public hearing and everything, and you still have it, and we've added a direct contact to the affected property owners. Now, as you know, the charter allows you to bill back to the property owners. It does not require you to. And as we talked about at, at the priority setting meeting on January 24th, council can either by ordinance, resolution, or some sort of other policy develop a policy of how much, if any, you will charge back to the property owners. Um, and, and I think you know we'll, we'll be having that, that discussion. All this does, it, again, is change the charter so that it's a, a cleaner, clearer process. But if you take out the public process of determining which sidewalks you're gonna do and then you say, you know, Glenn Mandelis, your, your sidewalk's getting fixed in two weeks, and that's the first they've heard of it. Right. And they say, well, wait a minute, you know, it's not, it's not in that bad of condition, or I'd rather replace it myself, you know. Looks, I mean, how do we... So, and also, by that time, you've also, in effect, created the, biz the assignment of the responsibility of right, the you obligation. Gotta leave the public, you have to leave the, well, the public... The obligation I, that Mr. Mandelis is going to pay for the... Well, I site. mean, again, and this, uh, this is what I heard when we talked about it on the 24th, that you all can do, can do a policy, you can decide however you want to do that, but there was discussion of the need for consistency that, so that we don't decide this year the city's paying for the sidewalk yep. replacement, right, right, but next yeah, year we we're doing this street and oops, you know. I understand. So what I would anticipate is if this, if this goes through in the charter amendment, we could specify in the code, and there's a whole section of code dealing with sidewalks, we can specify something more specific in the code. You could have a public hearing in the process um, you know, but this is, the charter is, we can't do anything less than the charter. So right now, you're, you probably have, once we have the bids in, you probably have a four month process before you can even begin to replace sidewalks. Usually, contractors don't hold their bids that long. So again, what this does is it, under the charter gives you a clearer process. Now, if we want, you could still have a public hearing. We, you could even, we could even change what we have in the language here about the public hearing, you know, to, to add a public hearing if you want to keep that step. But it's all those steps before and after that really make it, I mean, a months long process to be able to, to replace sidewalks. And I mean, we are constantly hearing about the need to improve our sidewalks due to tripping hazards, um, ADA compliance, and, and those things. So, you know, it, it's that balance of making sure that the, the public is part of, of the discussion, the property owners that are directly affected are aware, and, you know, making sure that the, the public portion of the process is beneficial. Right now, I don't think the public portion of the process is beneficial because there's no direct notice to the property owners. Right. Okay. okay. <clears throat> right. That, that, right. That's sort of the point. And, and the, I mean, the goal of a lot of these charter amendments is to provide more flexibility to city council, so you're not your hands aren't being as tied as they are now. You could adopt an ordinance when you send this to the to the legislature. You could adopt an ordinance that says sidewalk repairs require a public hearing or whatever you want it to be and make that ordinance effective upon 
the general assembly's approval of your charter amendment so that you would have some comfort level that there's still some level of public involvement that that gives you comfort but but um again like i, I think, like Anne Marie says i mean the the level of um process that's required for sidewalk repairs is is pretty extensive in connect when you look at it in the context of how much actual public notice and public involvement is is actually happening so all right um i'm going to turn to the audience now if there's i know i've, I've held you back on uh, there might have been questions you had on the very first one or the second one but uh, i think that was a more efficient way to get through it and uh, if there's questions from the audience come on up or anything up there and then uh, we'll do virtual too we know who you are, Bonnie, but you got to tell the audience who you are. I'll surprise you. Lois Osler, 901. <laughs> <laughs> well played. Well played. <laughs> That's what my tax bill says, which is, I guess, why we're here. Um, I'm going to apologize in advance if I'm a little piggledy piggledy on this because there was a lot of discussion. There's a lot of provisions here, um, but I'll do my best to be coherent. Um, I guess my first question is, what's the hurry? Um, the way your city manager explained it, you guys are basically going to have to ram this through, and I, I don't. We don't want to ram it through. God, Big no. part? I said, and we don't want to do that. No, no, you shouldn't, yeah. um, because there's a lot of really important things here. So I'm just going to go through, uh, as I, I mean, I'll have to go back and forth, but yeah, go ahead. Um, okay. on this first question about increasing your, um, your no no bid contracts from 25 to 50. If the problem is what the city manager described, which is that there's too much process, then just adopt a streamlined process. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to basically have a free for all. You can just make it easier. I think that's going to be much easier. As for the state contract, I don't know anything about how the state contract works. I don't know anything about how you get on it. Um, it sounded like with this cooperative purchasing agreement stuff, we're already doing it, um, but. I don't know that much about it. But I do have a lot of questions on this bonding stuff. And the most significant thing I want to say is that the charter of the city of Lewis now calls for letting your citizens have a say mm -hmm. oh, yes. when you take in big amounts of debt. And that is, I think, a sort of a sacred right of the people, because in the end, the people are going to have to pay for it. Yep. So in sort of glibly saying, well, we could have four million after four million after four million after four million, and the citizens never have a right to say yes or no, I think that's very disturbing. Um, and there is a big, big, big difference. I mean, the reason you guys are sitting up there is you get to vote. So you know better than anybody that there's a big difference between coming here and blabbing away, making comments the way I am, and being able to vote on something. And it's also important, I think, to remember that the city of Lewis has only ever done one general obligation bond. And that was in 2005. And while the city council and the, and the citizens, more importantly the citizens, no offense, approved up to 19.5 million in borrowing, the amount of borrowing originally for the city of Lewis was under $5 million. It was $4,895,000. Right. The bulk of the borrowing was for originally for the Board of Public Works. Mm, right. So this is not, you know, this is not, uh, of course, this is 2023, not 2005, but this is not an academic issue of, of what you're talking about here. Um, can I ask you one question before we move to the next thing? No, so I'm <laughs> commenting here. You have to wait well, until the end of the way I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will wait. Um, <laughs> The, the other thing is uh, the city of Lewis has plenty of borrowing authority already. I mean, what this deals with is bonds and whatever a certificate of indebtedness may mean. But the city, as you know, has lines of credit. It has other ways of borrowing um, already without public participation. I'm very concerned about this seriatim idea. You know, seriatim, that's a you want to explain. Seriatim Speaking just Latin means again. you do it in a series, right? Yeah. right. <laughs> but it's Latin, so the lawyers sound smart. Um, <laughs> but you, you could, this, this counsel or future counsel under this language 
could borrow three million mm -hmm. and then three point five million and then whatever again in a situation where it has taken away the right of the citizens to approve that borrowing. And I think that's very, very scary. Um, on, on this, there was another thing on here that really um, caught my attention. What line are you referring to? Uh, thank you, line 38. 38. 38, and it is, it is allowing for uh, borrowing in this provision to meet or defray routine municipal operating expenses. Mm -hmm. That, to me, is scary as hell. I mean, either we have a balanced budget in the city or we do not. And so the idea that you can then go out and borrow money to meet your operating expenses is, um, is concerning. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite concerning. Um, I also don't understand why we're at $75 million. I mean, since the city has only ever borrowed under this kind of provision less than five, 75 million strikes me as an awfully large amount. Now, it could be that you're taught you're, what you're considering, uh, given what's going on with the Board of Public Works, is, is a joint kind of situation where you would have to um, have an umbrella for their expenses, but I would urge Which you is to what you did with the 2005, right? Beg your pardon? You did, did you do it with 2005? You did it with BPW, right? There was a and bond. 2005, the bond issue. Right. You did it with. was the one and only general obligation bond, to my knowledge, right. the that you did with BPW. Right. Right. Yeah, and, and that's because BPW can't borrow money themselves. Oh, yeah, they no, I, I know that. Their, right, which, oh, which leads okay. to, it's a good point, and it leads me to exactly what I was going to say, which is remember that when the Board of Public Works borrows money of any sort, be it state revolving fund, or be it uh, in a bond issue, it is carried on the books of the city of Lewis. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, it affects a whole not, lot of it stuff. It isn't? Not, not anymore. Not the bond issue, if we're part of the bond issue, but when they get SRF loans, they are no longer on the city's books. Well, that's really good to hear. That, so I think that changed in their uh, oh, 2016 charter changes. So when they have to borrow $60 million or $240 million or whatever it was that was Settled discussed us. at that workshop, Mm. That, well, yeah, there, right. there's, it, That's it, bonding yeah. does require the city, but Correct. other borrowing, like when they do their SRF loans, it doesn't. That's great. So but my point is when the big right. ticket the comes big along, ones, mm -hmm. the big ones do. It's, the, but right. the big one comes along, it's, it's on your... Mm -hmm. Before uh, you move your, away from that point, I, how is there a cap on what the uh, state revolving funds are available to BPW? They put in the applications, I, I, you don't do, know. I don't know. Okay. I'll make I haven't. Of that. We, we can look into that. Thank you, Bonnie. And I'll just that. make one other practical point, and this goes to the fact that you know the city borrowed five million dollars in two thousand five, and this is twenty twenty three. The chances that you're going to go out to do a true bond measure for less than five million dollars, there is probably not there, which is why I would. But if they, but if it is, you need to get the people to approve it, not just do it on your own. I, I would think. <coughs> on the assessor issues. Um, so I, I, just to, to sum up on the bond stuff, don't take away the rights of the people. You know, that's a really bad idea. It's just one step where the, the city council, if it thinks it's a good idea, needs to explain to the people who are going to pay for it why and let them, and let them vote. value your opinion, actually. Well, thank you. On the assessor stuff, I do appreciate that. On the assessor stuff, um, the only thing I had on the hiring a firm is who's going to pay, how are you going to pay for it, mm -hmm. right? Because it, it could be quite expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, hiring a firm. What, this for well, the, what, for what this says, what you say here is that you, in, firing, in hiring an assessor, you can now hire an individual or a firm. Right. Well, but that's what we, I mean, so as, as you know, we've always had the appointed assessor, but then we have the person who does the assessments. Right. All I'm saying is that if you if you go whole hog in this, I, right. I'd be careful. And okay. the immediate point, which is interesting to me about um, how you can't find someone in Lewis, and I, and I know it's tough, mm -hmm. don't get me wrong, who is um, knowledgeable, a citizen, and not involved in real estate, but our last assessor was, in fact, a real estate agent. Right, and he moved out of town. I recognize that. I'm so, just saying okay. it's not impossible. We'll take right. any name you right. can give us. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I'm available. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on the pay. 
And, and you're the former treasurer. So yeah, there you go. The experience. And, <laughs> and you're a former, former treasurer. treasurer. And I'm a former treasurer. Yeah, absolutely. right. Um, on the assessment issue, uh, again, I just have one overarching comment for you all, which is, as you may or may not call, and there's no reason you should, I wrote my one and only letter to a newspaper editor ever on the issue of mm -hmm. county assessment right. and the, the formula that the county has chosen to use, which I think is on its face unfair to uh, residential properties and to uh, coastal residential properties in and of itself. So if I understand that what you're saying is that this gives you the option to go with the county assessment, and that is, it's attractive, right? It saves you money, but here's the thing. You have to decide, if you go that route, you could well be adopting, and not just adopting the assessments yeah. of the county, but foreclosing any local review mm -hmm. of those assessments. Mm -hmm. um, it, and I think it's, it's, it's a very dangerous road to go down because I don't think those assessments are going to be fair. Um, Monica, well, uh, oh, never mind, you, you, you chastised Glenn earlier. I'll let you finish. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, oh, she let me in. <laughs> 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 yeah, right, right, right. No, um, so I, I'd be very careful about abdicating local control. Amen. Over something like this. Amen. Um, the uh, can't remember what I was. Oh, the seven million dollars. One thing you might want to be sure about here is my understanding of the way a s post assessment real property taxation is supposed to work, is it's supposed to be revenue neutral mm -hmm. to, the, to, the, to the taxing authority. Mm -hmm. So when you go up to $7 million, um, that really makes it look like you're going to keep your current assessment rate um, on what are unquestionably going to be vastly increased assessment values. So uh, I would be very careful about that. I mean, Anne-Marie mentioned a couple of subdivisions that are coming in. Okay, fine, but that doesn't justify doubling uh, your taxing ceiling from 3.5 to 7. Um, so uh, so I guess my, my point to you is it will save, save the city a lot of money, but you're going to have a lot of very, very unhappy citizens if you were to say, okay, look, you're going to get assessed by the county under a formula that is not that is designed, frankly, to soak the coastal communities, the coastal residential communities, yeah. not the commercial th th things. And then you say, and we're we're like we're not going to provide you any kind of process at all at the local level. Now that said, mm -hmm. I understand that if you provide process at the local level, and you see just how unfair these assessments are going to be, you know that throws the apple cart completely mm. over. Yeah. Um, because yeah. what's unfair to one is unfair to all. Mm -hmm. But that's that's the point. They're going to be unfair to all, uh, yeah. at least residential properties, and that's mostly what we have here. Um, on the sidewalks, I, I just had a question. The, the notification of like, two weeks before exercise of any authority under the blah, 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 blah. Uh, first of all, you can do that by ordinance, right? You don't have to do that by... Right. <laughs> but, but the other right. the, the question was, because I mean, you talked a lot about how there's, you know, there's room for fill-ins through right. ordinances. So I'm not sure you need to put it in, in a, in a, in a charter, charter yeah. anyway. But, but my question was, that two weeks notice occurs at what point in the process? That was the part I didn't understand. Well, it, and we can change that. I mean, I, I think it's before we would begin any work. Again, we, we can change that. I think um, the main point there was to take out what's right now a very um, protracted, protracted, difficult process that provides no notification. Right. I would prefer to keep the notification in because I don't want to take out the yeah, protracted no, process and not give any protection. Well, just a couple of suggestions then. Uh, first of all, it's, it was news to me to learn that uh, clawing back the cost of sidewalks <coughs> for uh, property owners is optional. We were always told when we were on council yeah, that yeah, it was not, not, that it was mandatory. I think you okay. Well, well the charter says otherwise. Well, right. I'm just saying that that was always the policy of the city of Lake. So if you want to challenge that, if you want to change that, rather, you're, you're going to have a whole hornet's nest of unhappy people who would pay who have paid, sure. right? Sure. Mm -hmm. But um, if if the city is thinking of just basically making this a city expense, which frankly I think it should be, you know, this, this, the, the sidewalks are used by all, right. they should right. be paid for right. by all, right? Uh, then you don't need any of this process. 
mm -hmm. right? Because it's just mm -hmm. city expense. Right. If, if you are still going to, but on the notification issue, whether you do that or not, um, my suggestion would be that that two weeks notice <coughs> be before the before council the decides council what property is it's right. going to, exactly. because, you know, whatever. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I'll just go back to the assessment value issue for just one second and make a plea for this group to c remember that as tarted up as Lewis has gotten and as fancy dancy as we all are now, <laughs> Me. But, Did you uh, say tort or, or tarted up? Yeah. Tarted. Tarted. <laughs> Look it up. <laughs> I thought you were talking about torted. You know. well, yeah. well, we well, know that's that's too. Tort. No, that's the sidewalk issue. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but one thing that I would really, really like to emphasize is there are a lot of people in this city who live paycheck to paycheck. You're here. Social Security to Social here, Security. Here. When you look at these issues, please remember them, because when you give up your authority over assessments, right, and there's nothing in here that um, would allow you to give relief to people. So right. let's say I'm, I'm not going to name it, I'm Bonnie Osler, Lois. 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 And I'm <coughs> living in my house, and I can just barely afford it. Mm -hmm. Let's just say hypothetically that's true. And this assessment comes down from the county and the city says, yep. sorry, we can't give you any relief. Mm -hmm. And uh, it has always been my reading of the charter, and you know, you've got two fine lawyers sitting here to tell me I'm wrong, but it's always been my reading of the charter that you are not allowed to abate, abate, that is, uh, real property taxes based on individual circumstances, mm -hmm. the way it's written. Mm -hmm. And not That's only right. that, but it, we looked at this at one point on the um, uh, HPC, now H Park, um, on trying to come up with a way to give relief to people who had historic properties but couldn't afford mm -hmm. the, um, the improvements that were required to keep it up to snuff, you know. Mm -hmm. And it is very complicated to ask people to come in and prove mm -hmm. that they're they are impoverished, even <laughs> if you have the authority to do it. And That's I don't, right. I, don't, I frankly don't think you do. So when those new assessments come in, um, and they are as high as I think we all anticipate they're going to be because of the way the county has chosen to perform its assessment, you're going to have a lot of people in this town who are going to have to leave. Mm -hmm. you got that right. And that's really, really unfortunate. So yeah. I, would, I would urge you to retain some local control of assessments. Even though it's harder, um, it's probably <coughs> better. So you sort of answer my question, the, the question I had for you, which is, are you amenable to the idea that we could choose an assessor that would be the city's assessor, but have them be a non-resident? At least then yeah. we would have a resident. Does I mean, it make I, that I, much I difference? Make them a Delaware resident or yeah, right. county resident or something, right. somebody who knows right. something about right. this area. Right. Right. Uh, oh, I think Delaware definitely. I can't. So maybe we mm. didn't put that. Did no, we? No. no. There's no, there's no we so we do need to. to city. So uh, we probably need to look at that. Yeah, because the, I mean, the, there's just no. There's no replacement for there's no substitute for local knowledge. There just mm -hmm. isn't. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And Lewis, as you all well know, has so many quirks and oddities that um, mm -hmm. you know it'd be great if it was someone in the in the city. But next best thing would I guess be somebody in the county. In the county. I, I don't know. Amen. Amen. But it's it's tough. So all right. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bonnie. And I just to, if anyone has comment or no, questions great for Bonnie. Stuff, or, Bonnie. Or, yeah. Of course you do. <laughs> Damn we <laughs> <lawyer. laughs> <laughs> well, I can't wait anymore. So I find out. But not in public. But I question this area borrowing. And I agree with you that it non um, referendum borrowing didn't exceed $5 million. So you could do no. a $2 million, a $2 million, and a $1 million. No. No. no, absolutely not. Because, it, because you're, you're doing the same, because the, the same net result is the same. You know, whether it's two, two, one, three, five, six and a half, you're basically allowing the evasion of the right of the people to say right. yes or no. And, you know, that's, that's, that's a fundamental <coughs> That's a fundamental principle of government is you have to go to the people. Can I ask a question? Yep. Is, what, what threshold what threshold do you think <coughs> is the right place where, again, the aggregate amount, when you combine it all together, it's, I mean, clearly there's something between zero and, and five million that 
would work, right? So, well, what but, but realistically, first of all, I don't know what certificate of indebtedness means in the in the uh, provision. Going as a practical I, 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 matter, going to the bond market mm -hmm. is a big, hairy, expensive, right. time-consuming thing. Right. Right. But but whatever. So certificate. But the, the point here is, however you however you fix this, right? The the fundamental issue is. How do you let the people know what you're doing in their behalf? You'd have to look at your own right. borrowing history to right. know where that where that particular point is. I don't know. Right. But I mean, the, the, the most important thing, frankly, is not to borrow in little drips and drafts. Right. And, and, and I guess credit cards. You know. Yeah. So right. so my and, and again, what we were looking to accomplish through this, and I'm very interested in, in your feedback because again, you've got the long view on this. You you been up and close with our finances, is making sure that there's n that it's clear that the way we've been financing the trash trucks, that having, you know, just, I mean, we like our, our Lowe's card, we pay off every month, but just making it clear, we, we used, um, we did short-term financing through um, Ford, through Ford, for these police vehicles, so that we can pay pay the expense in the next fiscal year. You don't want to get on go on police vehicles. No, no, I really don't. I don't <laughs> Let me just say vehicles. Let's do it. But but again, there that just basic small level borrowing that doesn't rise to bonding, that doesn't rise to referendum, and again with the. The, the thing that like hit me like a brick on this was really the Jones Farm when I was asked to secure an SRF loan. Mm -hmm. And based on the way our charter reads, we can't do an SRF loan of one and a half million dollars without going to referendum. I, I would have gone to referendum, um, personally. I, I think that was what should have happened in okay. this case. But, but at that point, we had already purchased the property, so. Well, <laughs> yeah. But, but that so you learned a lesson, and next time you won't do it. But right. I mean, I, I guess I guess my my basic response to you is, you know, debt is bad. Mm -hmm. No kidding. Debt is bad in your personal finances. Debt is bad in your municipal finances. Yeah. Um, I mean, when I was on council, I can't tell you how many people said, "Well, what's what's our retirement uh, pension liability?" Because they were worried about debt, mm -hmm. and I said, "Well, we don't have any." Mm -hmm. We'd be thrilled. So I, I don't know the answer to your question, okay. but my basic point to you, I mean, you mentioned the leasing of, of the trash trucks, for example. We always paid that out of, out of the budget, out of the operating right. budget. Right. So you don't have to borrow. Right. So, I mean, my basic response is don't borrow unless you absolutely have to. And if you absolutely have to, do what happened in 2005, where the city rolled all of its necessary borrowing, I mean, for Bay Avenue, for mm -hmm. renovating this, this building, all the things it did, Roll it together and present it to the people. That's okay. exactly the that's, way to do that's it. My, okay. That's my yes. overall view yes. on that. Mm -hmm. yep, yep, I mean, yep, I'll, yep, I'll yep, tell yep, you, yep. It, it's in New Hampshire, right? We have a town meeting every year, right? Not good old fashioned New Hampshire, you know, New England yeah. town meeting, right? Which you read about when you were in grade school. Well, they do it. And we have to vote as a group mm -hmm. on every single what they call warrant item. And that is every single major expense. And you know it's. Um, and what's that defined as? By over 100k, or what is there a? You know, I don't remember. I, it, it's a threshold. Okay. Uh, but it, but it's 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 trucks, it's cars, it's police vehicles, and you sit there and you the you go through each and every one of them, and it's 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 a really in, it's a fascinating process actually. The, some of the questions that are asked are really interesting, but um, but so I guess my point to you is, and that's not borrowing. That's just whether or not right. you have to do decision making. Expense. Right. So, and I think that that, that that process developed. Of course, there didn't used to be credit right back in the day right. when all this started. But I think that that is that is emblematic of how important it is to have citizen involvement in that kind of thing. So, you know, that, that's my. I, sure, it's more process heavy, but. You know what? At the end of the day, the the day. you're not going to have people saying, "You damn spendthrifts! Look what you did." You know? Right. So. Okay. Thanks, Bonnie. Thank you um, very much. I, you know, I think we'll, we'll have to cut it there because we do need to move on. I know we spent a lot of time on this subject, but they're they're weighty yeah. matters. So, Dennis, you come up. We'll yeah. give you the Appreciate last you. statement here, but yeah, go ahead. Um, 
Thank you. Nice sweatshirt, Thank you. by the way. Uh, I think I couldn't improve on Bonnie's comments yeah. anyway. I, but I would reiterate, taking your time, do it the right way, always involve the people. I know when I did court hearings, before I got finished, I always asked everyone in the courtroom if they had anything else they wanted to add to the, to the process that day. And the, other, and, and the point is, please, don't rush this. It doesn't matter if you get it through this General Assembly or not. But let's, let's do it the right way and not rush it. That, that's my biggest addition to what Bonnie said. Thank you. Thank you guys. very much. And, and we'll leave it there. I think, um, you know, as, as a way of moving forward is if this goes forward to our next agenda, as you said, we'll, like, like I've said previously, we'll have two, two sponsors. If two of us think that this, we want to advance some or all of these, then we'll, this will appear on our regular, regular agenda under, under council sponsorship uh, of two or more. Um, so let's move to E3. I think this one might take less time. I don't see John here, but are you ready to walk us through this one? Yes. Okay, so this one has to do with um, swimming pools uh, and the setbacks related to swimming pools. So I'm going to turn it over to you and then I'm going to take a, um, a, break. a restroom break. <laughs> <laughs> are, are we on recess? No. no. We should take one. You've got to keep rolling. So, okay. Yeah, we're going to walk through this ordinance is to fix a pathway that was created by the past practice. Um, for the placement of swimming pools, is there an accessory structure they're supposed to follow? The accessory structure reg regulations. However, that's not how it's been enforced. So what I would like to do is create regulations that recognize the past practice for the setbacks for a swimming pool. So swimming pools, like any, like any detached garage, have a setback from the side in the rear yard. But what they have allowed to do in the past is let them be closer to the house than 10 feet. So there are some, some swimming pools that are maybe three to five feet from the back of the house. And then people who have pool houses, those pool houses are closer than the 10 feet that is required by code. So that is what this ordinance is proposing to do is to recognize a past practice. So we it's clear going forward, everything that's been placed in the past is recognized so we can, we can um, continue allowing swimming pools to be recognized. Right. And Janelle, do we have any pools that are built in the front yard or no. are currently placed in the front yard? No, not no. that I'm aware of. Okay, so the language that's included in here would actually possibly anticipate accommodating a pool in the front yard, is that correct? No. Well, maybe within the 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 front yard. It has to be behind the 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 front of the house. The frontmost portion of right. the house. And so it could I, be in the side yard. But that, and that, a, and at the same. I'm trying to think. It cannot be in front of the house. Well, it can be. I understand. It can so start at the where the house starts and like on the side, but it cannot be in the front of the house. Oh, it can start on the side. Well, then Correct. I. Well, then shouldn't. Wouldn't it just be easier to just state so that there won't be a swimming pool in placed in the front yard? I don't understand why you would even. Again, I'm just trying to keep the, the language the same. I'm sorry? I'm just trying to keep the language the same um, because right now for accessory structures, um, you cannot have, it has to be behind the front most portion of the main building right. or 50 feet from the lot line, whichever is greater. Um, I'll be bringing that for a change in the future. Um, but right now it's just, if you want a, a you know, um, a swimming pool, it just has to be up beyond the front of the house. So like if your front yard setback is 25, f is, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, How about on my street? Right, so there's one that's in a, r a rear yard, yep. but also it, it's, to, it's a corner property. Yes. Mm -hmm. So there's one that's in the rear yard based on the front of the house, but mm -hmm. it's on the in the front yard, yard I think, on based on the it Bradley looks zoning. Mm -hmm. And it's not a three lot, right? No. No. <laughs> no. It's but it is a corner lot which is, yeah. Yeah, it is. Okay. So right. And it corner lots, um, depending on the size of the lot, um, can actually have reduced setbacks and if it's 65 feet or less, um, the corner, the shorter one, it gets treated as a side yard and not the front yard per, per the code. So that's a cider. So it would, well, it's a front yard. It also, ha it has side yard setbacks. It has reduced se setbacks. Okay. So that's different. Um, again, if it's a new swimming pool, 
Is that a new swimming pool? It's relatively yeah. well, it's, it's yeah, less. a few it years. Was, yeah, the last it, couple it's years. It's been at okay. least two years. <laughs> yeah, it's so just again, a, I'm trying to go from yeah. real, now, now moving forward. Now moving forward. All right. That all right. All they right. need that we are recognizing code what the past practices have been done. Now maybe there's something out there that's really wonky that I'm not aware of, but I do know. I got the, one for you. Go ahead. Well, a, a pool that's on the third floor deck. Yeah, right over here. What? The papers. Um, right over. Right here? over. I don't, I don't think there's a prohibition. It's part of the structure. Yeah, it's part. Of, it's part of the structure. I means print that. In that so case, how it that means. Work done if it's distance from. From main building none that allows that. So again, this is for accessory structures. If it's if it's on the third floor, it's part of the principal structure. So the fact that it says none allows it. Uh -huh. Correct. That so if it's so you again, got an indoor pool, a, board, a pool that's on your roof, your deck. It, you have to comply with your principal structure setbacks. If uh -huh. it's not part of the house, um, like I'm putting an above ground pool in the backyard, it's a detached structure. Okay. It's not part of the house. If I'm putting if I'm putting a second floor and I'm just extending that out, I'm putting a, a swimming pool, it's attached to the house. So mm. it's part, it's strictly detached um, buildings and structures. Okay. Okay. That's helpful, yeah. thank you. But yeah. most mm -hmm. swimming pools are, uh, it seems to me that I see being placed here in the city are in ground pools, Yes. correct? Uh, and uh, they would be, can you describe what, how a pool becomes attached to the main structure. In other words, does a deck that connects to the building, that it, it runs up to the back of the wall of the building, is that considered attached? I'd have to look, there are a lot of nuances that could be considered. Um, typically the way we consider it attached, if it's like on the second or the third floor, that it's really a part of the structure. Um, sometimes you're, you know, what we see is in ground is that, you know, um, the only thing that's, that um, connects the two is a patio. That doesn't make it part of the structure because the patio is not part of the principal structure. The principal structure is the building itself. So if it's, uh, you know, if, and again, what we've been seeing is house sto stops, I put patio, five feet later, my, the pool starts. That, right. that's, that's not attached to the house because the pool, because the patio doesn't count as the principal structure. It's a separate structure. It's the house itself makes it the structure. If I put pavers in and then I put a pool in three feet away, I'm not part of the house. I'm a, I'm a separate structure. But I guess to, to his point, what if it's an attached deck? Is the attached deck to the house. That's right. still that not part of the structure, right? No, because decks have different setbacks. Right. De decks have a different setback. Um, so we actually recognize you have your principal structure setbacks, you have different setbacks for decks, and then you have, um, in this case, detached structures and buildings setbacks. Again, this is for everything moving forward. Going forward. And this actually cleans up some of the stuff that has been installed in the past. All right, thank you. Okay. All right, so this one, um, is this considered a zoning change? So we, this would, would require a public hearing if we go there in Correct. the future? Correct. Okay. Okay. So same same rule applies. We want to move this forward onto an agenda. Two of us will get it on there, and then we'll, yeah. the, action, yeah. the next action then would be to send it to a public hearing yeah. if we go that route, right? Correct. Okay. But in your mind, this needs to be done. It's more administrative than anything else, right? Correct. Okay. Yeah. I'm okay. just trying to clean up, sure. make, get legal what's been done in the past. Okay. okay. And move forward so there's fairness and e equality going for pools. Thank you, Jenny. Okay. Um, hmm. Interesting. Uh, just yesterday, I was walking around and I was in a community that's not my community, my immediate neighborhood, and I saw a pool that was being constructed uh, in the backyard, and it would appear to be really, really close to the rear lot line. And I and it, it's not a. Sorry, let me think. Is it a, cor <coughs> it's a corner lot? So maybe, well, we'll talk later on about uh, that, but I think, again, I th yeah. This it's is three feet though, isn't it? It's I three mean, or five depending on the zoning. So it could so actually be very close. It's an R2 close. area. So R it. R2 would be five, I think. Five right? feet. It's five feet. But that's the edge of the pool, not the patio. 
Because the patio can go so to the, the property line. So the patio could go up to the property line. Correct. Correct. Because it's, think of it as I just want to put pavers in my backyard. They can go to the property line. Mm. Okay. Mm. And it's again. Where we count is where the edge of the pool is, unless the edge of the pool is raised. That's and then amazing. it has to meet five feet. So. Is that, that really what we, is that really what we want? It, that is how it has always been looked at. I understand. It might have been um, looked that and way and practiced that's typic, that way. That's a, that's a standard practice for, throughout cities, counties, and states. So you got these setbacks from like an international code? Yeah, everybody has their own little differences of, of setbacks. Hmm. Thank you. All right. So the next one is... Um, I see Sumner's left, unfortunately, oh. but um, yeah, yeah, this is one actually um, we had on a previous workshop. Janelle has uh, worked uh, through the state uh, agricultural um, department and also includes some language here, but this is the idea that if we want to maybe approve the keeping of bees, which is currently illegal in the city of Lewis. Um, I, you know, I'll speak for myself. I think w one of the benefits in my mind is we, we, I think the bee population is actually decreasing. So in my mind, this would be a Lewis's way of saying, you know, we care about flowers, trees, and other thing else, and mm -hmm. we'll do what we can to uh, bring, <laughs> help the bee population. Um, so, Janelle, do you, you good? Yeah, do no, you, I just say yeah. pollinators are important yeah. to everybody. No, no, no. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. Janelle, do you want to just walk us through kind of where maybe you've, you've scraped this language from? <laughs> so I, I, I did do a lot of research um, I went to the, the state's information. So, so again, um, if you're going to have any type of keeping of bees, you do actually have to comply with the state regulations, which I put in the, the code, yeah. and you actually have to <laughs> register your bees um, oh, with, right. the state, um, with the state. Um, so I looked at the state regulations. I looked at other towns, other uh, cities, other states. Um, so I kind of and they were pretty much all the same um, regarding like the queens if you know if the queen if the colony starts exhibiting you know aggressive behavior which they typically don't do mm -hmm. then you replace the queen um, watering um, you have to have a convenient source of water um, the flyway um, it's a barrier so again keeping the bees from you know going um, they like to fly over things so they don't go into a neighbor's backyard um, the location, um, trying to keep it, you know, in the rear and side yard setback, so the the hive and the colony is not in the front yard, um, and then distances from other, you know, from the property and then from other houses um, was something that was um, I saw throughout, um, you know, keeping it so general maintenance, so you don't get swarming or robbing situations, because if you have if you don't keep it clean and honey gets other places, then you, you get other bees that wanting to come in and take over, and then you can get some aggressiveness, and you don't want that. Um, so we just kind of looked at I looked at a lot of the different ordinances and and just kind of followed what they were all doing. Did your homework on this? Sir? On I did. And what are on the, the distances packs? from other structures and such? I, I wish. Um, Unfortunately, Sumner yeah, he isn't here, but there were, he brought up the, whether there's um, distances between other hives or anything like that. Because one thing you did put in here is the, the permit, the shall we require a permit. Is there thought around how, like, we, not everyone should be keeping bees, obviously, and, you know, whether there should be a, a cap on. Yeah. yeah, so most places didn't do that. They, they um, you know, they did it by the size of the land. Okay. which is why um, I did um, two per per parcel because um, a lot of them were looking at um, larger acreage um, quarter acres half acres and then the larger the land the more you could have and I figured we're just a pretty small community we'll just cap it at two because that was the lowest number anybody ever did um, a few did have a separation distance from a, a um, actually, I did do the adjacent house. Yeah. Most of them didn't really have a separation from other hives. Other hives I, okay. I did not see that really in any of, and I, and again, I, okay. Maine, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, Maryland. Yeah, I, I, I've, got, I got a nice little folder full of, um, and that wasn't in the state regulations that I recall as, uh, as well. And then my last question, and I'll turn it over, is that where they have to register with the state uh, apiarist? Is that right? I believe uh -huh. so. Yeah. Okay. Does that? Um, like is it easy? Like could Tim call up tomorrow and say, "Hey, I'd, I'd like to put a beehive," or is it a? Does he have to go through some training, or do? You I believe there's some training, okay. and I believe there's a process, and they actually have to, you know, um, 
you get, I think the bees actually have to be inspected to make sure they're not diseased. Um, so there's a lot, that's why I also referenced, you have to comply with the state rules and regulations and they actually have definitions of like the colony and the hive and all of these things. So I figured we just And do they the have state. a function that comes, cause I like, you know, I don't expect John Robitaille or anyone on his staff to be experts on this. Would the state then be available to for us to call on to say, we've got five beekeepers, can you go around and make sure what they're doing is yes. cool? Yes, because uh, one of the state, um, the state apiarist is, um, a, we, she, I believe she, um, they are, they do inspections. If they get a complaint, they'll okay. actually have to, because uh, again, they're, they're, you know, they don't want, there are certain bees that yeah. there are allowed in the state, um, certain honeybees, certain certain um, um, things. They're looking for diseases. They want to make sure that the hive is kept and maintained in a, in a good um, working condition. Um, because we can turn that over to the state. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I think we just asked for a building permit so we could sure. kind of track know where they them are. and yeah. yeah, and know where they are. So if we get complaints, we know. Well, then you can also make sure that they're placed with the setbacks. Correct. Uh, Janelle, are there any examples where uh, bees are kept in any municipalities in Delaware? Dover has them. Um, and I'm trying to think, because I, I went straight to Dover because I knew they had an ordinance. Okay. Um, and then I just kind of did an, a random search, but um, there might be a couple other towns. I just, I didn't. Um, I knew Dover had an ordinance, so I just like for farms it. keeps them. So probably yeah. Camden. So Camden, Wyoming, probably has them. And the county um, allows it. I mean, right. they or people are doing it illegally. Right. The county. Right. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. that people are keeping bees mm -hmm. in our general area. <laughs> yeah. Not, I don't know if they're doing it in Lewis. I mean, but okay. Okay. Well, I have a, a question just about some of the wording. The the colony shall be 25 feet away from any adjacent principal structure. Does that mean principal structure on an adjacent lot or even on that lot? From an adjacent lot. Okay. I can, that, I can that tweak might that be, a little bit. Yeah. That's a, to, from keeping, you can put your eye right next to your neighbor. Correct. Yeah, so. It's like yeah. if you want it closer to your house, that's fine, but you know, right. my neighbor is like, let's have a little bit of a my, separation my distance. My be allergic neighbor. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, really same, are. same situation. So, so this one's a zoning. So Correct. Same process. If we want to continue down this path, a couple of us will sponsor it yep. and send it to a public hearing. Mm -hmm. and so on. Okay. All right. Let's. In, any questions from the audience? Anyone online raising a hand? All right. Let's keep moving. The next one then is um, E5. This is a discussion and process for a right of way license uh, following the adoption of ground cover ordinance. So, it's for those, I know Dennis recalls, but there's others that. Maybe not following. So, uh, six months ago or so, five months ago, we passed. October um, 10th. Yeah. Right. October we 10th. passed an ordinance about ground cover, and it did speak to the fact that if you uh, would want a license from the city, there would be that option. So, this is an attempt to uh, right. create that process. And I, I'm going to let Kayla. Um, it, you have a, a brief synopsis in your packet, but. Kayla's been getting the calls, so I'll let her explain okay. the, the question she's getting and you know why this is before. Mm -hmm. um, so currently, ever since it's been implemented, Jonathan, the code enforcement, has been going around and checking and make sure people are following the protocols. Um, and if they are not, they are receiving a letter letting them know and to contact me to apply for the license. Currently, I do not have an application for the license. I do not have a fee to set for to have um, Glenn's office to draw up the paperwork. Um, as far as I'm aware, there is a $10 yearly fee. Um, for other licenses. For, for, for most licenses for most that of we've them done, yes. And um, encroachments and such. So, um, because I've gotten them about um, sprinklers, the bushes, fences, you know, all of those types of things in the right of way. So in circumstances like sprinklers, for example, are these people who are looking to put in new sprinklers or are these people who have a already existing and now they're saying, Potter. now are they self-reporting and saying yeah, I need? They're, they're no, they're not self-reporting. They're, they're, they're found. So some okay. of them are oh, new. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Jonathan, what Jonathan does is, if I can. Yeah, go, go right ahead. Yeah, Jonathan, what he does is he goes out and does um, 
an inspection. And he's riding around town all day looking for making sure people are in compliance. They've got building permits. They've got their licenses. And when he'll stop somebody and it's like, hey, you're, they're trying to put in an, an irrigation system in the right of way. I'm like, do you have a building permit? Sometimes it's no. And then it's like, well, you need to stop work because one, you need a building permit. And two, you're doing something in the right of way you don't have permission to do. So, you know, if you want to put that, you know, that fence or that berm or the sprinkler system, you need to apply for a license, which is what you have identified. And then we'll reference, because the license is not through the, the planning and building department, it goes through, um, goes through council. So I think Kayla's just looking for, well, when mm -hmm. we find somebody and they don't want to they want to continue doing what they're doing. You need an application. Yeah, yes. I need an application. Well, I need yeah. a set. She needs a process. A, a process, a set cost, and well, the, you the know. one thing I would just say on the licenses, and it, this gets down into the next one, not to get too far ahead, but the you know. administrative process around leases is I, I think it's, uh, as far as I can read, it is our job as a council to approve licenses and leases and such. And so that part for me, the license would need to be reviewed by councils in a similar way that we review you know, <coughs> leases on canal uh, or, or other. Um, so that would be one. And I'll just uh, suggest, I just think easy enough is um, what what type of material, what are they asking to be put into the right of way? Um, that would be on the, well, we you know, on the application, what, what are they asking right. to be put on there? Um, Currently the only, um, the only two I have, one is a fence and the other is a sprinkler. No, those no, are the I'm, two pending what I'm, saying, I'm not looking to approve those today. I'm saying in uh -huh. terms of what the application should include is just simply be what are they looking to put in there? I well, the could. ones that are currently on that got approved, the list of what got approved needs to be on the application because these are the list of, of things that you approved to be in the well, right of way. No, we, we, no, we pretty we much were, said you can't do anything in the right yeah, of way without yeah. a permit. So We basically said concrete and... Asphalt are no good. Yeah, Everything yeah. else they need to ask yeah, for. Yeah, you have to ask for. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So she, I think we're just you're trying to come up with ideas for the application. So well, the application is one thing, yes. but the uh, the other thing, and and Glenn and Alex, you might be able to speak to this. Um, developing like a, a boilerplate fill in the blank mm -hmm. um, license that you know and. And to what degree, if we have a boilerplate license, to what degree is there legal review needed on each one? Because again, there's a cost, obviously, when we submit something to the solicitor for review or, or development. Um, so do, do we have cost incurred? Because like, for instance, when we do a lease extension, the the person requesting the lease exp extension pays $350 to cover all the legal expenses. What degree of legal expense, and you don't have to answer this now, but these are the things we need to figure out, is incurred for each one. If we have a boilerplate, is it, mm. could we just fill it in and bring it to council um, and have a much more modest fee, or do we need some legal review of each one that would have a, a larger fee? So you've got the application the the fee for the application based on what degree of, of legal review each application needs. The annual fee, one of the things um, Councilperson Ritzer and, and I had talked about was, you know, you've got the $10 a year that we've done before, but, you know, if somebody's requesting a license for the entire frontage of their 120-foot wide lot, is that annual fee different than if it's, you know, 20 square feet. Um, you know, so, so do you do something based on area or linear footage? I mean, th those were kind of the things. So, so I don't see this being ready um, to like take to council at the March meeting. My thought was to get the feedback from you so that we can develop something to then put before you at a workshop that then, then you could, right now we're asking the question so that we could start to put the the structure together. Okay. Any other comments? I, I, that that was my main comment. I, I just don't think this, fortunately or unfortunately, is something that we can assign to the administrator because right. we've said that they need to come to council for a mm -hmm. license. Well, so. We need more. Yeah, and I, and I I agree. I would not want to administratively grant these, mm -hmm. frankly, because I think that it it creates a potential issue mm -hmm. down the road. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean.
mean, I think, you know, like other things, maybe w in terms of what they should submit with the applications, again, what, what are they looking to put there? And then if some crude, maybe even a crude drawing of, you yeah, know. we need a description. Where it's going. Right. Or do you. Before the council. Um, right. Have so to, Jonathan has taken pictures and given them to me. That could work. Yeah. So I can yeah, apply similar those to like as well. we do with the leases, which is like this is where we'd like this to go, that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, I can do that. And are we anticipating that we're going to need a uh, if we're do doing a renewal every year? Does that also trigger a oh, another inspection uh, by our inspectors to make sure that it ha we haven't had mission creep, so to speak? So there's I know, you know, we wouldn't do a renewal every year. Typically, they're written that they're in place and until the city decides to remove them what we do is we bill every year I guess the question is on the administrative side of things should we have a process of reviewing them before we bill them to make sure that it's not something like, that was were we given a license for the berms on like Bay Avenue or something like that there were I think we, we when did. we went back and counted them um, um, nine licenses for encroachments that have been granted um, for properties that front Bay Avenue. So could we could replicate that mm -hmm. process? I mean, if that's working, okay. Yeah, you know, the one other thing I'd like to throw out administratively is that uh, whatever documentation is created, whatever files are created, is that that documentation is shared with the BPW because they, mm -hmm. in fact, are the party who is most likely going to affect yeah. the area which is encumbered with these uh, encroachments. So we have to build into our process that they have the same information that that we are retaining. Um, can I make a comment on that? For, s for certain things like, like sprinklers, they are supposed to notify because typically it gets separated for BPW. So a lot of times if someone has an irrigation system, they are aware. But the other things, I can make them aware. I, I think redundancy in this case is better mm -hmm. than any gaps that might occur, mm -hmm. and I think it'd be really, really helpful that any any approvals that are granted are there they receive the same information. Yes, Kayla, they may not um, have a separate meter for irrigation. They may choose as an owner to use their main water source for the irrigation as well as the the water that's inside their house. So I don't think they're obliged to get an irrigation meter if they have an irrigation system. And they some could also be expanding their existing uh, irrigation system. So, so some people do actually have it done. It, it is actually on yeah. the bill that I, it's their water. And I have one. And, yeah. I have, I have, yeah. so I have two separate bills for my water. Required. But you're, you're not required, not required right. but yeah. some people do it just so they know mm -hmm. the difference. Wow. Yeah. And that's actually, right. For an irrigation meter, you don't pay for the sewer. So I think that's the, right. that's the yeah. reason people like to do right. it, but mm -hmm. not everybody does it. Correct. So we likely to see this back on the workshop before we see it on. Yeah, the, I mean, yeah. It, once we have some some meat on the bones, I, I just kind of wanted to, to introduce the idea to you, kind of get that. any yeah, thoughts you may have. Or, did you have a question? No, I was just going to say because we have that. And it, is all, it is all about. Can you come to the microphone because oh. we've got people online? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Good to, good to see you, Marty. Give her the Thanks for coming. Oh, here are the wireless mic. Marty Durasmo, 18 Ship Carpenter Square. No, I was just going to say we actually have a separate meter, and the whole idea behind it is we don't pay the sewer fee. Exactly. For the, but I, uh, I, they, they did it for a while, and then I didn't know that they were doing it anymore. I do have a question, though, now that I'm up here. Um, <laughs> we, you're going to bill people every year? To, if they have something, if they have a license to have something in the city right of way. But what, I mean, I can see it, I can see an initial, like, paying for it, but really and truly. Do, do you want to talk about it from a, the... a tree in there, and then they have to pay a little fee every year for it? What are you doing uh, with the berms on Bay Avenue? Are they paying the, it? The, anybody who has a license gets an annual, should it's be separate, getting the annual. Property tax, is that yeah. right? Mm -hmm. separate, separate, no, it's separate. separate. I mean, arguably, you're, you're creating a property interest in a, in a private owner to public land. So right. there's something being given, and so there should be some con consideration coming back, which is the annual the annual fee for use of that area. Um, it's a little bit different. I you know I think I do think that right of ways are probably a little bit different for you know putting some sort of ground cover for parking purposes or whatever is, is different than using public property to extend your deck or do something exactly. like that. Yeah. I guess I'm not allowed to comment on the previous. 
Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> we're, we're, we're towards the end anyway. Okay. Uh, <laughs> come on, just <laughs> cover the sidewalks at the city. Mm. I, I, I didn't believe it when people told me yeah. that they had to pay for their sidewalk. Yeah. I said, no, 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 you can't be right. Just for goodness sakes. <laughs> yeah. I make, make some I, thank you, Marty. Well, I'll know too. Marty doesn't have any sidewalks. So. I, right. Yeah. I had to litigate a case like that one time, and it costs way more to litigate the case than to replace the sidewalks. Yeah, so. exactly. Just, just do it. Yeah. <laughs> now we got Marty. Now we've got Marty. <laughs> it's the Marty. Marty's right here. Marty Thompson, three Flamingo Court, in the Grand City of Lewis. Um, I'm just a little bit baffled by the discussion about irrigation systems and such, and mm. uh, I know right-of-ways are really problematic in different parts of the city. There are different issues, but I live in Pilot Town Village, and I do have a curb. I have no sidewalk, and right. the city owns as part of the right-of-way like maybe eight feet or so of what I think of as my property, and right. everybody in the Pilot Town Village thinks of as their property, but we know there's a lot of utilities under there, and if the city has to ever come in and dig up, we know that our trees are whatever. I'm just not sure why you needed to have a big deal about licensing the irrigation system. I mean, if somebody wants to put a deck there or pave it or something, that's another situation, but I, I read the new ordinance this morning, and maybe I misread it, but it seems like it says, if I put my irrigation in there and, and the city has to come and dig it up, it's on me. That's fine. Why well, do you want to mess with getting a license for putting irrigation the there? The, so the, the problem that we have is a lot of people, one, don't realize that certain area is not their property. So we have had people have an issue where BPW goes in to fix a, um, you know, a water leak, a sewer leak, you know, something or a, you or know, a, a, right, service. something that is their infrastructure that is supposed to be within the right of way. And then they come back and say that the board or the city needs to, to pay to repair it. Right. So the, this, is, this isn't going to fix that. that well, no, 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 no it, but if you get a license, the license will specifically state that well, if, if there's a, an, you it, don't, if this is just a matter of getting information to the citizens. Getting a license isn't the way to solve it. That just adds a whole lot of bureaucracy about getting a license for something relatively minor, like putting in irrigation pipes, which they go bad all the time anyway. And people have to dig them up. And I know when I put my fence in, I did get approval from everybody at the fence. <laughs> so um, the, you know, the, 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 the people who put in the irrigation system were careful, and some of it was right. Hmm. Some of it was over the property line, actually, and I've been having to correct that over time, but. So it was right there, and uh, you know, got wrecked when I put in the fence. So I, I just think it, if I don't see why you need to have a whole licensing system if, if the point is to tell people, hey, this is this is this is the city right away, and we could come in. But I think if you issue a license at that point, I, the way I read the statute, then you are responsible in the future to dig it up. No, because the <laughs> license would specify specifically oh, that okay. that any any the I just think need to. I mean, it's the idea uh, is to get information yeah, well, out about. We've the tried simple. Where if you plant a shrub there, we tried just simple, do that. but it Don't didn't work. Don't issue a license. Don't bother issuing well, a license. We, we, no, we tried simple. It just didn't work, Marty. I agree with you. I mean, it's something that well, unfortunately the uh, path we have to go down. Yeah, no. Well, we got to do something. If the initial draft of the ordinance, if you remember, it, it established a license by ordinance, so you wouldn't have to right. go through the process of approving it, and that, that didn't pass right. council. Though. So it, it would have been an ordinance initially that said, you can put these items in the right-of-way, and a license is hereby granted to do so. Right. But irrigation wasn't one of them. No. No, right. not yeah. at all. Yeah. No. Yeah, that was more like mulch, you, like you chose like mulch and grass right. and sand and stuff like that. Like, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Um, okay, so let's move on from that one. I think, as we said, that one's not ready, queued up for action right. probably this month anyway. Nope. Um, and then the last one then is discussion around administrative property for 99 year leases. And I, I kind of played my hand. I, I just think, I don't know that we're, Do we the state of Delaware gives us that 
that option on the 99 year leases to be handled administratively. So what I was going to suggest is we treat it more like maybe consent agenda. Right. And have them all on Where we have, exactly, like we've been doing essentially, yeah. is to say, well, we here are eight of them. Last, you know, yeah. are you there, just did that the last yeah. time. Right. Are there any of them that are objectionable? We pull those. No. Right. And then we approve the ones that are okay. Right. And we had that conversation with Councilperson Ritzer the other day. Um, and I think the way we could accommodate this is after, <coughs> on a regular council meeting, after your reports, before you get to new business, we could have a heading similar to license like and lease business, renewals. New business. You could have um, license and lease renewals, and that way you could do it all on consent agenda or pull Any something. I, I, something I like that method. Do I do too. I okay. like that Tim? Yeah, I'm okay with it, uh, uh, but. I uh, comment to the staff, and that is we have to be very consistent in the supporting documents mm -hmm. that come with the lease renewal request, you know, with the photographs, mm -hmm. with the, the survey, et cetera. Uh, yeah, that would be yeah, a reason because, to pull them if they have incomplete information. Because if they're if not they have incomplete, complete, information, they, they will right. be pulled. Well, speak right. for itself. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, <coughs> come on down. He got confused for Joe Hawkner this morning with okay. coffee. Really? <laughs> Someone said thank you for your service. <laughs> I was trying to think of what that was. Um, I'll be brief. And I appreciate City Council taking up their vigilance on our city services, trucks, the beach, protecting our beaches. Um, you know, parks, landscaping, but you're ignoring the fact that you routinely rely upon a law firm for which you have no rate schedule. Those services will be put out for bid, regulated with the same scrutiny. That you consider landscaping, beaches, trucks. Up to all the members of the city council here. Up to all the members of the new staff. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there anyone online, Blue? Okay. So, as I said, E7, uh, we thank everyone for participating. I know this is a little bit protracted from our normal workshops, but we, we covered a lot of ground and important ground today. Um, we are not going to take up E7, which is the renaming of the tributary. And I think we have executive session tomorrow, so there's no need to. Well, Glenn's not here tomorrow, yeah. right? Right. So if there's so anything that, that you need one for, <laughs> I'm personnel. not aware of anything. We can do personnel stuff tomorrow, though, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we don't need them for I don't know that there was anything that we needed. And nobody's brought anything to my okay. attention, so. So then, can I get a, um, a call to adjourn this meeting, then? Motion, All right, Carolyn. And I'll second. Tim, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Thanks, everyone.